Hello, good morning, and uh, welcome back to the Game Dev Show here today with Jason Story and Andrew, and I think Corvallis may be joining us in just a little bit, maybe some other people. So good morning, welcome everybody. How's your day been going? This is my first thing. Actually, I saw two jackrabbits in my backyard. I think one's pregnant, so I'm going to be a grandfather. So, oh, finally, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's taking this long, but one of yeah, them is gotta... very fat, so I'm pretty sure they're making babies. So that's start calling around, thing. making some yeah. posts on Facebook. Yeah, these little jackrabbit babies are going to be little on their e-bikes running around and. <laughs> <crazy>. <laughs> Oh, it's good. So, so what about your story? You got jackrabbits yeah, no, no too? Jackrabbits. No, no, no. Oh, uh, that sucks. I'll, I'll, I'll keep an eye out in the garden, though. You know, who knows? Might have some news next week. Nice. Good stuff. Well, yeah, today um, I wanted to do a couple things. First, I want to make sure that we go back into doing some tips. So we're going to do a little round of tips of the day, talk about some useful things for developers. I also want to answer some questions in chat and talk a little bit about uh, GDC 2024. So the conference just ended, was there last week. Um, Andrew was there, a couple other people were there. I don't know if anybody else that was there is going to show up, but there's some interesting stuff. Um, a couple Unity things, a couple non-Unity things I thought people would be interested in hearing about and learning about. Um, possibly some interesting new opportunities there as well. So that's the plan for today. Anybody have anything else that you guys wanted to make sure we talk about this week? Nope. That's uh, I've got some tips for you. You've got some tips. <laughs> I'm going to learn you a lesson. All right. Well, let's uh, let's save those tips for just a little bit and start with uh, some of the GDC news. So that way everybody can hang around for the really exciting tips. Talk about some of the stuff that we saw at GDC. So for me... There weren't a whole lot of giant announcements, but there were a couple of things that seemed really cool and very promising. Um, on the Unity side specifically, there was a lot of work around URP and rendering performance. And it sounds like from the demos that I saw, there are now some options that are just going to speed up performance with basically no work from developers. And, mm -hmm. and they're adding some functionality back there to make it a lot easier to work with it if you're an actual graphics programmer. But I was more excited by the performance stuff. I, I like whenever there's a checkbox that speeds things up, especially the, I don't know if you guys saw it, the AI based, there's a spatial temporal post, uh, uh, no, some, uh, some, some letter, some combination of four letters that I've lost track of that essentially does AI upscaling and the way that it was being explained is that it can essentially render the games down at half resolution, a quarter resolution, and then have that upscaler run and nobody can tell the difference visually. You got to get down to 10% or lower before you could tell. And obviously that means a huge performance improvement because if you've rendered a game at 4K versus rendering a ga game at four, 400 by 320, obviously yeah. massive, massive difference. So that, that was, I think, the most exciting and most promising Unity-specific thing. But what did you see, Andrew? Well, wait, I want to touch on that for a second because I didn't see that, but I've heard you talk about it multiple times, including last week. And I wasn't able to ask anyone about it. But, okay, the so I, I know enough about the screen resolution to know that when I went from an iPhone four to an iPhone five, that was higher, much higher resolution or something. It was like crazy slow. Um, mm -hmm. But going from 4k to 400 by 300 yeah. seems ridiculous. Like, yeah. What, what, how would you describe the difference in impact of that change i mean because in my head it, it seems like something that's going 60 frames per second would now go like eight thousand frames a second or something i don't know what like how big of an impact is that change that's what i'm wondering i haven't actually been able to try it out i just saw little clips of the demo so it sounded really promising to me it seems like it would be massive but there's got to be some cost in doing this too it can't just be like that you know you're getting 8,000 frames a second. Although that's what I would feel like, you know, if you're shrinking it down. It also, I guess, probably depends a lot on the type of game that you've got and where it's where it's bound. You know, if it if the resolution is a problem, but anything that wants to be There's a 4K also, game, I would think this is going to be a huge thing. 
It's also a matter of um, at which point in render passes can you do it. Because mm. uh, it depends on mm. what your game is doing and what calculations it needs. It's kind yeah. of like doing any, any sort of draw calls, right? Like certain draw calls can only happen based on transparencies and what you need to do. And if you need depth buffers for this side or the other to pass the certain shaders, d- depending on what you're doing, you might still need to render a high resolution something in some cases for certain things if you need like accurate data versus generative data. So I don't know. Yeah, I guess it really did. We'd have to see stuff in action based on context, but yeah. I do think, but even just like data throughput, if you ever had to deal with any kind of file um, streaming or uh, try to do like, um, uh, yeah, a good example is video rendering. If, if you ever worked with any transcoding stuff of any kind, um, the difference between streaming 1080p versus 4K is comical. The amount of information, the cost of the, both the data transmission, the store, all that stuff, um, the the time cost of like transcoding in real time and stuff. So even even like cutting from 4K to to you know 1080 would be phenomenal. It's like half the problems with internet throughput is down to the fact that the bandwidth costs of 4K and 8K video have gotten really high. So um, yeah, like I can see it being a really big deal. I don't know. From a speed and frame rate thing, I'm not sure. Simply because, again, you're you have to offload the AI cost of actually doing it and whatever. But I do think, in general, yeah, I, I definitely see it's going to be a big deal. I'm just a question of when and where. So, hey. Yeah, yep. it's, it's crazy. That that's all. It's like a magic button. That's what it sounds like, and I want to press that button. That's what it, it also, sounded like to me. There's also style transfer. Um, one of the older papers from um, Two Minute Papers, fantastic channel if you've not seen it. Um, basically, they look at any kind of research paper that's kind of a couple of papers down the line and they watch the progress. One of them was taking video games and applying realistic filters over the top with with AI. <clears throat> so it's not just a matter of saying, okay, we can upscale an image, but you could take an image that's set in Miami and switch it to a different location or put something in a snowstorm by basically taking an image and saying apply snow snowstorm it. <laughs> yeah so um there's a lot of interesting potential there uh not just for realism but for all sorts of other style trends so like that to me is fascinating not just the idea of performance but the fact that we could even get to the point where um it's more than just sepia tone filters it's now like actually do you want it to look like a certain style or game or even location you know mm. you don't want everything just in sepia tones Strangely <laughs> enough, I've never been super impressed by a uh, Sepia camera. Yeah, that, was, no. that was the new tech in like 1992 camcorders. It's good stuff, yeah. Turn it on once and then never never hit the button again. Yeah, and then ruin all of your video forever. <laughs> Very <laughs> destructive. <laughs> yeah, so so uh, the, what we were talking about there was a new feature, and um, I, I believe it's part of Unity 6 and not out now in the URP setup um, where they've got this post-processing upscaling using AI stuff. It was one of the Centis projects that sounded really interesting was kind of the combination of Centis and uh, and rendering, which I think is where there's going to be a lot of game-specific value for AI is in that rendering side. In fact, that's going to be one of the strongest points because it's kind of global and, and beneficial everywhere. Like, like Story was saying, if you can make your game after it's rendered look like it's in snow, and magically that starts to become the type of thing you can do. Um, it, it's going to be really powerful. I think I'm going to have to learn URP. Yeah. Yeah. I think everybody should probably start switching over to URP eventually. Um, if, yeah. if they're not already, and most of the time what I've seen, and I'm curious for the two of you is, uh, that, and everybody in chat too, if you, if you don't mind, just let me know, do you use when you start a new project built in render pipeline or universal or maybe HD, but, I personally, I generally start projects in built-in, and then if I if I decide that I care about the visuals and I'm going to do something with it, I'll switch mm-hmm. it over to URP. And for me, that's largely because of the startup time, the setup time, and I know that if I want to just go grab an import and asset, um, it's going to work in built-in. It may or may not work in URP. I might I might have to spend you know five minutes going and upgrading it. And if I don't care about the visuals, I'm doing a test, a demo, or something code related. Um, or even in the game that I have now, I'm just not at the point where visuals are something I want to spend time on. Then I'll just stick with built-in until I'm ready. But what do you guys do? What's, what's your workflow? There's a ton of URPs in the chat. Yes, um, lots of URP in chat. I do built-in, but this this I'm caveat, right? Put an asterisk by my name because I'm I'm putting stuff on the asset store. So I want to you know maximize my market, which means you can't 
currently downgrade from URP to built-in with the little button, but you can go the opposite direction. So it's much easier to ship in built-in, get that largest market share. But this is where, you know, Unity 6, I think they said it's going to default to URP, which means a lot of new users are never going to use built-in. They're going to think URP is the new standard, which it will be, I guess. That's the whole point. Mm -hmm. So at that point, it means, um, I, well, I guess for a while I'm going to have to ship in both built-in and URP because anyone using Unity 6 is going to be screwed if I ship in built-in. They're just going to get the pink materials and I'm going to get people messaging me in one-star reviews and stuff. So yeah. um, currently built-in, I've never really used URP. I have a little bit. I've used HERP and URP just a little bit for, I've got these random ground textures on the asset store that nobody buys, but I used them for that um, and to do blending of the ground and, and all that stuff. So, um, oh, okay. Yeah. So you're mostly built in, but largely just because you're doing a lot of asset and stuff. Yeah. But also I'm lazy. I don't want to learn a new thing. Don't make me learn a new thing. I, I, you know, <laughs> unless, unless the new thing is going to blow my mind and make everything better. Don't make me learn it. Just, uh, before story way, answers, everybody in chat, do you think that URP should be the default or they should leave built in as the default for six? Personally, yeah, I think just... switching to URP as the default would probably be good, which is really yeah. just a change in the hub, right? Yeah, like yeah. it's literally just changing the default in the hub. But what do you think, oh, story? Um, well, to, to first answer, like I very similar to what you said, which is when 90% of what you do is write code, then most of these questions are sort of irrelevant. And so I often start and built in because it's just faster. It just opens faster, it works faster, is less stuff to play with. Mm -hmm. um, but if I'm ever doing GIFs or demos, which people have seen a million times, I'll always make little example videos. Uh, I'll switch uh, for that because the big difference for me, even at a small scale, is even out of the box, the way lighting works. The default lights are just like a number intensity. But if you're using URP, you can actually set Kelvin values and things, which are quite nice if you understand like three-point lighting setups and that kind of thing. It's just a little bit nicer for those. So I'll usually upgrade the same thing. It's, it's actually quite simple to upgrade. Um, it's like two, two scriptable object assets, drag them into the right place, and it's pretty quick to get going. Um, so yeah, I normally start built in into URP. Uh, and then I'll occasionally play with HTTP just because it's shiny, especially the fog volumes. I really love the fog volumes. Mm. Um, but then to answer your question about default, I'd say it's about time. I mean, even though I start and built in because it's faster, legitimately, the, the problem I, I have in general is that the Unity ecosystem is so fractured that any standardization is good standardization. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's it's a hard pill to swallow. And I, I go back to the biggest example of this, which is Unity used to have, and they still do technically, a lot of extension functions built in that were wrappers around get component. So every mono behavior could write dot rigid body and get get component rigid body pre done for you as just a one line thing. Same with get audio source, whatever. They didn't cache them even at the time, but they would basically have these getter functions because they wanted it to look like native behavior. And then they accepted that's probably not good practice to retain. And so they broke a lot of stuff when they ended up switching to the uh, C sharp side exclusively. Um, and a lot of people freaked out because almost everybody who was using the JavaScript style of writing, none of their stuff worked anymore. Um, and yeah, there was turmoil for a bit, but the truth is that's one entire set less of things for people to support, problems to debug, issues to solve, and so on. And so in my opinion, even if there is stuff that I use, I would rather them pick a lane and lock it in. And so even I would even say the same for things like the input system and for whatever, I would want to see more standardization just so that all future documentations, rules, and stuff is at least consistent. Because then if it's consistent and people have to use it for different use cases, you get more bug reports, which is more problems to solve, which means the singular thing gets better. If multiple people are using multiple different things because some are better for others, then you're going to end up getting fragmented use cases that only get more fragmented because they get fixed in the direction they're being used. And so you'll never get a cohesive answer. So yeah. yeah. Jason Story for president. <laughs> I think that that all makes sense. And I think um, Jim's called something out here that's a little bit interesting too. And I'm curious what you guys both think about, this, especially Andrew, because um, you probably dealt with this a lot. But mm -hmm. a lot of the it says a lot of problem with the URP is that a lot of the assets they try to convert just don't work without manual adjustments. And I found that that's usually when somebody has a custom shader on their asset to address something that wasn't there. Um, yeah. Do Do you think that that's a uh, 
I mean, obviously it's a problem, right? Yeah. Is there a good solution to that to make it so that like things can get converted over? I mean, I'm I'm certainly no good at writing shaders, so I don't really know if there's an easy way to convert yeah. over all the custom shaders. I I'm gonna guess not, but. I mean, it, it, so the problem as I understand it is that URP and HGRP, those are also on versions and they change. So, and they always change in lockstep with the editor version. So one day, uh, especially for a NAS store publisher, and I think if, if Pavel were here, nature manufacturer, he'd, he would cheer me on when I say one day. You would probably have up. a lot of good stuff. Oh, on this. <laughs> yeah, he would, he would be fuming. Uh, they'll wake up and they'll find that, oh, their package is broken not because they did something, but because URP or HDRP suddenly changed mm -hmm. and broke something that they were relying on. That's the, the, the root of the pain, I think, because for most standard, for standard share things, you can upgrade. It's not an issue. It's just a button. It's a, it's a friction yeah. point, but it's not an issue. But these custom ones are very hard. So the solution that I've had for my shaders, because I have a few shaders that are um, custom, so I've made HDRP and URP versions, is to use Amplify Shader Editor because with that I can make the shader and built in, then bring that shader into URP project. It will work in URP, export it, bring it into HDRP project, export it, save those as Unity packages, then it will work. You just have to extract that Unity package and the shader, the material will, will no longer be pink. It's not a very However, good workflow for users that bought the stuff, though. And if the artists aren't going in and updating things, yeah. which they're the definitely not going to do on most stuff. Screwed. Then that's why you get some stuff on the asset store that's compatible with with uh, URP, but not built in. Because, yeah. they did, you know, but and I understand Shader Graph can do more of that now. It didn't use to, Shader Graph originally, if I'm not mistaken, was URP only, which really i never used it because of that because i was not going to use urp years ago and um i couldn't do a urp only thing so i never i've never actually used shader graph i understand that might be different now and, and probably will be different in the future so maybe it's time to start using shader graph but okay. yeah story i agree like <laughs> i don't really do. I don't, yeah I don't, I, I'm, yeah pretty much said like i don't i don't have a lot to say on, on on that to be honest um i don't i don't do a lot of shader work personally so I, I as much as i have strong opinions as everyone knows i try to keep them the stuff that i have first-hand experience with um and so for me i often work with artists and so i tend to i wouldn't want to step on toes for for workflows i would say just for me personally though like i said it's i i'm more looking at the long-term effects of um the environment and the guides and the usage and that's why i, I mm. favor the the mm. sort of because i've seen fragmentation in other fields it's, it's why android was such a nightmare to develop for in early days because of screen size resolutions and stuff so to, i'm just looking at the macro problem but on, on a, like on the individual stuff i hear a lot of stories from people about um this render pipeline missing a feature or shader graph not having parity features for this or the ui platform not having these particular features like world space rendering um but my answer to that isn't okay, use the old one in per perpetuity because, again, you get back to the, well, then there's no ever, there's never a reason to upgrade the new stuff. If the, if the new stuff replaces and it doesn't have features you want, you've got a very justified angry mob complaining that it's missing features and now it has to be fixed. It's no longer an optional thing, right? So it, there's there's pain points. And if, if, if we were removing one engine to move to another and you could never use the old one, then I could have, I could see an argument to be more cautious. But in a world where all old versions exist and you can just use one and not upgrade where needed, that's fine. But when there is an upgrade down the pipeline, I think that's a really good candidate to bite the bullet and make hard choices to like have a friction point. Because if you're going yeah. to have a friction, you might as well do it properly and like use it to really enforce change. Yeah, I, I think this URP thing is, uh, I, I think we all agree, it would be good to just make that the default um, and then prob uh, probably eventually just get rid of I mean, I think they've been talking about deprecating built-in for the last 10 years. So <laughs> <laughs> eventually eventually do that. But yeah, get it as the default, um, get yeah. it out there and make sure everybody's... In. There, I think there's still a couple little problems like uh, Greg had mentioned, but just trying to get build size down. But I think they're like, I could be wrong on this. Powell could correct me next week, but I think they're around like 98% parity on there on, on just about everything, especially with the upcoming stuff that I saw coming. So or parity is the most more. important thing in my opinion, when you, when moving from a yes. one, like, like when I'm honestly, as many people know, I'm working on new humans and I've been working on new humans for a while. And one of the big things that has to happen is parity. I can't yeah. not going to release new humans that don't have the same things 
and features as the current humans. Um, parody is important when you update. By the way, if you're watching live, don't forget to hit the like button. Good, good call, Martin. <laughs> um, so, yeah, other GDC stuff. I'm curious, Andrew, what was the best thing that you saw? Or is there anything that you think everybody would be excited about? I've got a couple other little things. but So, unfortunately, I only got to walk around on the show floor for about two and a half hours. And most of that time was literally for the day job. So... I didn't get to see everything on the show floor. This is the first year in many, many years that I've not seen the substance designer or substance folks, which I don't know if they were there. I didn't even see the booth, so maybe they weren't there. But I always like to go say hi to this one guy there who's been very nice over the years to me, uh, Wes. And, um, And so I was very disappointed this year. I did, however, have a great time, and I met a lot of publishers. I hung out with you and Johnny Thompson. Uh, who's Turbo Makes Games. Johnny Turbo. And, and it was a great time. I, I had Denny's at 2 a.m. one night with, with these guys from New Zealand. It was <laughs> it was late, and that, luckily that was the only late. I didn't get COVID this year. Last year I got COVID. So I, really I did most everything I wanted to do, except I didn't get to walk around the show floor that much, and so I really didn't see anything that, oh, okay. that is interesting because I just didn't – get to in the, well, in the you, you saw you got you said you got to talk to some publishers i got to talk yeah. to um a bunch i, I had to interview some i'm sure you saw but yes. some of them showed me some interesting stuff too um brian i think you know was showing off this new ui system that they've put together and they started announcing and releasing which i thought was kind of interesting i'm curious to see if that how that's going to integrate into game stuff and um Adam from Procedural Worlds was showing off this uh, UI or not UI um, terrain system where he had a 900 kilometer area, all rendering, streaming high speed um, and looking really great. Uh, It was like a 30 by 30 kilometer area. I thought that was pretty interesting. I don't know if you got to see the the previews of those, but they showed me some videos and they look look really cool. I also I think I I told you this, but I didn't tell everybody else this. I got to meet the. the proto factor guy he was oh, yeah. there and i found out he lives right down the street from me <laughs> i was like oh this is, this is amazing small world so i have to get together soon and uh start doing a meetup or something i'm actually using his stuff in uh in my game project his and uh, some of yours <laughs> yeah. yeah they do actually this is the the proto factor infinity pbr stuff do work pretty well together which i appreciate because they have a huge library or he it's, has a huge library. It's a is a crazy library of cool stuff, and yeah, it it actually looks really good together. Um, I wait. It's gonna look better once I switch it over to URP and put a light in there. Right now, the lighting is 100% default, and my terrain is flat with me drawing four different textures. <laughs> I was actually talking to some artists about a uh, level stuff earlier, though. So maybe I'll do something slightly prettier than programmer art. I'm surprised uh, you didn't go to the AI for for basic textures just to pop out four textures. No need. I already have a million and a half ground textures. Okay. I, I, it would take me more time to do that than it would to just search for my ground textures and go pick four of them and pop those in. Yeah. Uh-huh. Way, way more work. Yeah. <laughs> and it wouldn't look as good either cuz I'm not an artist. I would come up with something shitty and just pick an ugly one instead of the ones that they picked. Uh, I found the same for like icons too. I, I went to look at icons. I was like, oh, I can generate icons. I was like, what am I doing? Like, I have oh, yeah. literally packs of 5,000 icons and I have multiple of those. No yeah. problem finding an icon that I needed it, and, and they look better. <laughs> like, yeah. And you're not going to get the consistency I yet unless you know a, a node graph yourself or something. But that will take a long time. You know, and I'll, I'll save the actual, like the super pretty work for an actual artist or designer. I just need something that looks good enough like i need i need the warcraft icons you know everybody's got the world of warcraft icons i, I can have those too it'll be fine <laughs> oh oh looks like we might have a corvallis um so yeah anything you didn't see anything else so super exciting unfortunately no um okay. not because there wasn't anything there just, just because you I, didn't get a chance i didn't get to see yeah yeah so there was um uh, there were a couple things that i saw that i thought might be interesting to developers one was that discord i don't know if you heard about this has a new game system that they're starting to promote and they they set up a game jam where they're 
taking ideas for games that are built and run in Discord. You basically build a WebGL game and it runs in Discord. Um, they're doing grants for those games. I think they said like up to fifty thousand uh, dollars. And then by the end of the year, they're going to have a monetization system so that you can monetize those games inside Discord. And it seemed like a really good opportunity because they've got a fucking captive market, right? Like they've got millions of users that are all game players sitting there that they can just pop stuff up to whenever the hell they want. So it seems like they've got a good opportunity there. Um, and yeah. it might be a, a good time to kind of like break in somebody looking for a new market, something to get in on early. And they weren't just looking for games. They're also looking for interesting game-ish apps and game-related apps and stuff. So, One of the kids in uh, my friend's kids, like she's probably 11, I think, surprised me last summer. She was playing games on Discord. She's like, oh, I just play on Discord. I'm like, what? Yeah. I didn't even know you could do that. Yeah, and, they've got uh, a couple on there now. Yeah. And so, and I had no idea that she, but the, you know, if that's what the kids are doing, right. Then I would say, yes, do that too. Cause that's going to be what they want to do in the future. So get in early devs. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like it's, a, it's another one of those like early, it's an early market, but it's an early market that already has a shitload of users. You know, it's not like an early market where they have to go sell a device and, and get people on. All they have to do yeah. is pop something up that is interesting enough. Um, I mean, that that's that's part of the thing that always gets me. Uh, you know, we're in this world where we're talking about the highest fidelity, the big, biggest resolutions. And then you see the kids and they grab their switch, take it off the big screen TV and just sit in the corner like this <laughs> playing on the small screen. They prefer that. And then you got other kids choosing to play Roblox with the crappiest graphics ever, no shadows. And they play that for hours and hours with their friends. And it's like, wait, wh why are we focusing on, on the highest, you know, fidelity stuff when all the kids are going to not give a crap about this. Design trumps fidelity. And I heard grants and came as fast as I could. <laughs> yeah. Well, you should check it out. I'll send you the guy's info too. It, it looked interesting. They've got, um, I think, six different categories, and you can enter your game idea. I don't. It doesn't have to be a working game, and then they'll pick the ones that they want to fund. And I think he said it was up to fifty thousand um, dollars per project. Um, I could be mixing that up with one of the other grant things that I heard, but nice. uh, I think that was the number. So it sounded interesting. And then obviously the, the monetization afterwards sounded even more interesting. It sounded like there was opportunity to have you know, good good number of users, if, especially if you're early on. I feel like getting early in on any marketplace is always beneficial, especially if the marketplace is huge. What are you, what are you thinking though, Story? You've done this quite a few times, like gotten in on new stuff. Um, um, I'm probably a bad candidate in this one simply because uh, I'm... A, to, to be cautious on the phrase, there's a, a term called inshittification <laughs> that refers to <laughs> platforms over time that slowly pivot their market from trying to provide value to the consumer and try to provide value to their shareholders, mm -hmm. which is understandable and eventually happens. Um, and let's just say Discord's original sales pitch, it's no longer doing what I wanted and now seems to be doing other things, which is fine, but it's the I'd be cautious on the captive market audience simply because... I have been using Discord for God knows how many years, and I have never once, I have frustratedly closed that game tab every time it pops up of its own volition without asking me. And it's more and more buttons are showing shops and things for sale and more cruft I have to deal with. And so let's just say if a good competitor comes up anytime soon, it's a bit simpler, I might switch. So I'm, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, but it's they've got, got a captive market. market that I feel like they've got too many users there. It's going to be difficult to to compete yeah yep it's kind of like with current social media apps too you we would all love an alternative can anyone say they enjoy twitter slash x I'm but used to. you're there because other people are there and thus you kind of have that lock-in bonus points for server lock-in where people unironically do business on discord will it be for games and apps questionable but there are definitely a unique you have a very specific subsection of people who are power users for discord and they probably will be the heavy users of stuff like games and app services to see where that goes. Yeah, my son is a Discord programmer addict. 
It's like it was, I, I mean, I mean, you say that when it comes to power users, but I mean, if I say control slash or you know control K to the room here, I don't think anybody uses those keyboard shortcuts in Discord, but they're very important. I mean, I, I would mildly classify myself as a power user in that category, but well, even Jason, I'm you're a powerful that. person. Okay, you don't count. <laughs> But I, I just, yeah, I do think it is definitely an audience thing. It depends on who you're, who you're engaging with. And there is streamer culture in younger generations. There is certainly people play games differently and do different stuff. So I don't, I'm not saying there won't be a market, but I do think if you do enter that area, you're going to have to um, target to the right people. You know, you'll have to understand mm -hmm. who your audience is and who plays those kinds of games. Um, Cause it, I, I notice every platform tries to copy each other's ideas. Um, like even things like Zoom have games you can now play in Zoom, and it's like cool. I don't think I, I have ever wanted to play a game in Zoom. Like don't I, I use Zoom. I, I'll use Zoom for meetings, and I'll even use it for social meetup stuff sometimes. Um, it just doesn't feel like it's commensurate with what I'm trying to do. Discord mm. is more closer because it's used for people for um, everything from meetings to shit posting. So that if you pick the right audience, you might capture the right thing. But yeah, mm. it's it, I think it would really require. Uh, an analysis of the audience who plays those games specifically, age groups, categories, things they care about, etc. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I you would to, want to be an active Discord user too. If I had a good guess, idea, it would probably games would probably fit best where you have a specific Discord community that's decently large. Statistically, one programmer uses it because so many programmers use Discord, and thus they make something kind of themed around that community, and thus that's something they engage in. Is my guess for like your best use case for if you wanted to do or a this cool that like lets them really. do stuff with that community somehow and theme it for each one yeah mm -hmm. could be good or a game that ties in could be interesting i was wrong on the mount though sorry it's only thirty thousand, so never oh, mind not enough <laughs> uh, 40s my minimum okay yeah <laughs> sorry. At least all right one thousand <laughs> yeah no it, it does look interesting though i feel like it's a one of the things that if you're looking for a new project or you got something not sure what to do with it, it could be interesting, especially if you're big on uh, on Discord. If you like doing Discord usage a lot, you don't like being full screen and giant, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. See, so, yeah, I, I, I thought small. that one was pretty interesting. What's up, Corvas? Oh, no, just full screen but small icon because my camera still refuses to work. It was fine <laughs> literally 30 minutes ago. It was ago. fine earlier, yeah. And sorry, mine was in the wrong aspect ratio and still isn't focusing right. So I, I, I wouldn't worry about it too much. Oh, yeah. Other than that, um, at GDC, I saw lots of cool games, some interesting input stuff. Um, I saw almost no crypto, which was not surprising. It was pretty much gone. Um, I did see a lot of generative AI, though, which I think was another interesting thing. There was lots of people working on faces, people working on bodies, um, multiple companies doing AI-based animation where you just say, hey, you know, make this, this lizard man hit a tennis ball with a racket or whatever, and it just does it. Um, and there's quite a few people working on um, AI model generation, including those guys that did the the Roden one, which looked pretty interesting. They, they've got a new demo out. Um, so I thought that the AI generation stuff was an interesting kind of theme there. None of it was really production ready, but it's all this promise of, you know, this will be the next year stuff. But what, what did you guys, did you see any of that? Or did you hear anything uh, about that stuff online? I didn't. I just saw Dave's video on it. It made me laugh. It's like, <laughs> yep, yeah, bit, bit ropey. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, he did one on the Unity one, right? Yeah. 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 Well, it seems like... What about you, Corvallis? You, you've been watching this. Have you seen all the generative uh, animation and model stuff lately? To be honest, I've seen some of the model stuff, and okay. I've had a little direct engagement with the animation stuff because I used Cascador for a project mm -hmm. I finished recently. But for where it's at... It's really good to help you get started faster in a nice like toy sense where if you just like want a model and but you already know what you're doing for modeling, you can spin up like a little prototype faster. Again, AI gray boxing is where a hell lot of it's at. And yeah. I'd say for even like animation stuff, Cascadeur stuff is decently mature where it's much more of an assistant where it just helps you get from one frame to another and it cleans up your in-between somewhat. But there are definitely areas, even in a, poly, a product, I'd say it's definitely polished like that, 
where it is being a bit too opinionated. So for example, it has like an auto fixing feature where you can move a character and it then tries to guess every limb movement that logically follows along. And a lot of my animations, it just broke. I, I couldn't really use it for my specific use case. So we end up just using the normal rigging system and it's mm -hmm. decently intelligent curves. But yet again, there's uh, one animation of my project that I'm really glad no one frame by frames, because if you do, you'll see the character's spine 180 degrees for about two frames and then snaps <laughs> back because the uh, interpolation could not figure out how to twist that properly. Let alone two, for whatever AI app you're using, there's always some level of friction taking content from one program and putting it in a new ecosystem. No mm -hmm. matter how seamless the pipeline may be, there is a friction there. So like Cascador to Blender to a game engine is three different hops and three different potential sources of things going wrong. If you want your almost ideal AI tool, it should be some kind of integration into software you're already using because the AI yeah. tool is already likely to make a mistake, exporting it adds layers of potential mistake and cleanup. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm excited about it because I hate doing animation. Um, Based. And my default is to go to Mixamo. So this is like a, a nice step up and not, I mean, every now and then I have to reach out to an actual animator, but most of the time I, I really, really try to avoid it if I, if I don't have to. And Animation's for me, hard. what's up, Andrew? Animation's hard. It, it's just, yeah. it's a hard task. I've mm -hmm. always found that like I just don't have enough animation work to justify an animator full time on most small scale projects. There's just not enough stuff, but you need a little bit of stuff, which makes it really difficult. Like, yep. Like you just need a slight tweak to this walk or a grab for like this particular thing for the purpose. A lot of my stuff I have to kind of custom bootleg. So mm -hmm. I definitely get it. Uh, something that could just very quickly whip up a base that you can then edit is again where I really like where AI can be is for yep. me. I can animate. I wouldn't say I'm good enough to be a dedicated animator, but I can fuck with something that exists. So give me something basic. I can then tinker to my use case. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my, my problem is just patience. Um, mm -hmm. Animations to do it properly with the whole various animation rules. Sure, I can have some base keyframes. I can even nudge some stuff. But once you start looking at like, you know, shifting feet and you know how hands how wrists rotate to get things to feel right with weight and composition of things it's just it's so much tweaking like mm -hmm. i i'm bad at it like it, we again i watch videos at 3.5 x speed like that's how little patience i have in like normal day to day and if you're sitting there having to go okay this 15 second frame I have to make sure that at every point the the weight of the carry through from the kinetic, it's just, I can't do it. I have so many times I've tried and I know what needs to be done. Like I'll find tons and tons of reference material and I'll frame by frame it and I'll watch stuff and I'll watch the like um, follow through with animation and I'll try to do it. And I always end up going, that's enough and leaving with stuff that's terrible because I just don't have the patience for the amount of work required to really do it properly. Yeah, it's it's a whole skill investment. That's why I say I do it like as a tertiary thing, but to do it properly, you're spending coder levels of time, system design, and knowledge into it. And it's just a it's always a trade-off for how much am I willing to invest in it? You could probably get it done to a high quality, but you know, that time, that triangle of time, quality, and cost, how much time am I willing to invest to get like a certain quality level versus I just pay someone? Yeah. I think Jim just shared this. Uh Mesh Capade, apparently Games from Scratch did a video about it. Mm. I've not seen this one. It looks pretty interesting, though. Mesh Capade. Is it like AI generating the, both the mesh and the animations? Motion from text, motion from video, body shape from images. That's the three things. Yeah. My, I, I haven't watched the game from scratch thing, of course. My experience in, in like mocap from what I've heard is a lot of animators will be like, oh, I could do mocap, but it takes longer because I have to clean it up so much. That's faster just to make it myself. Uh, if you're a good animator, probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah there is a truth for that. Because, uh, again, not best animator, but I've, taking a mocap and cleaning it for me is about the effort of what I'm willing to do for an animation. Because making it from scratch is hard for me. Yeah. But also, depending on what you want to do, mocap may or may not just even be able to encapsulate it. Because you might want yeah, something. Yeah, most of the time... Know. Most of the time, my friends will say they'll use um, the, the the animators I know. They'll they'll use the motion capture purely as a reference frame. They won't actually use the raw material. And, and often, it's like it comes down to as well the type of motion capture you get, mm -hmm. um, because 
like the the actual motion capture is relatively complex not only just from a like you can get something which superficially looks really good like there's so many cheap suits now you can buy a motion capture suit for about eight thousand, which will be more than good enough for everything you'd ever really need um because it's just imu sensors in like an array that then uses sensor fusion to calculate stuff and mm -hmm. it's good enough to like record and, and get something uh you can even get cheap ones for seven or eight hundred but like the point is, even if you get your full, perfect recording, the problem you have is you always need something like external sensors to get your kinetic, um, your, your kind of kinematic stuff, right? Because even if you have a perfect match motion, if someone jumps, you can't detect the, because all sensors jump, right? There's no, mm -hmm. where was the floor? How do you know they actually jumped, right? So you end up with just, it just looks like a pose change. So good sensor stuff has external cameras plus the sensor suit plus all the other stuff. And so the point is, even if you have a per, even if you don't get sensor drift, which you will, because every single sensor will have drift, mm -hmm. even if you can aggregate the sensor drift and average it out, it looks fine. You'll always get some weird behavior specifically around things like jumping or uh, feet positions or whatever. And then even if you have all of that correct, um, you're not you're probably not wasting your time with hand sensors because the glove technology is actually often different. It's a whole different thing that you do as a second layer. Same with like face stuff. It's so it ends up being a lot of like two or three different systems working together to build something when on balance, 90 percent of stuff can be just, you know, done as a, especially for like large motions. Obviously, facial capture is usually still done with the actual capture because it's much harder to do that practically. But body language and stuff, almost it's almost always easier to specifically in small cases to do um, like hand gestures, talking, picking things up. It's just faster and easier for for most people. Mm -hmm. uh, a point in um a point in motion capture's favor, but it is contingent on the user. Is for stuff like character acting, adding flavor to a walk. If you know people who can do the physical acting part of fleshing that out. It can save you that because for a normal animation, you might not know initially the full flavor of the walk cycle you want. But if you have someone who can do that and they know that intention, you get it decently quickly. And at worst, you still just generated really, really good reference for exactly what you want. So definitely in the favor of if you can do it, just with the capacity that you have. If you know someone who can do yeah. that, it just requires like actual the physical desire to act that mm -hmm. out and capacity to do so convincingly. But I've seen some plus, crazy plus, physical actors that like yeah, yeah, blew like, me away. Plus the other part of it too is like, again, without going into super, super weeds on this, um, there's so much technical information. Um, I have a friend of mine who's a pencil drawer for characters and um, portraits. And the amount of information they know about, you know, different bone lengths and distances and that they, they know that the, the spine rotates at three different points and the rotations are at different degrees and there's only a certain amount. And so you can tell when someone's maximally rotated and have, like, all of this stuff that I don't know, but they need to to kind of get this stuff right. Um, with, with a walk cycle, for example, um, you won't notice it consciously, but I guarantee if you took a, a, a mo-capped children child walk versus an adult walk and applied that to a character, you can tell the difference because there's a, there's a certain body language difference to do with this. Like everyone has these different things, but there's like a whole concept of feet pronation mm -hmm. and how, how much foot uh, heel toe to the ground you have and whether you slide your feet or whether you don't slide your feet, the inner gate of the, the, how your thighs sit. So there's like so many of these little differences between men and women, between, you know, children and adults, between people of different weights and size, like so much stuff that if you're applying the wrong um, walk cycle to the wrong character, it'll feel off. And um, yeah, it can be very interesting. But, but again, the difference is if you get it right, there's something intuitively really accurate that you can tell is just infinitely better than the alternative. So yeah, there's a reason why even when people are doing prop animations for motion capture, they'll still hold props because you mm -hmm. need that sense of body weight and motion to match the appropriate stuff. Yeah. Absolutely. And hey, if you have good hand sensors, God, it saves you time on hands. Hands, so many fingers, so many joints, so many places where that can go wrong. Mm hmm. Yep. That's why people don't show hands in the games. Mm -hmm. Here, let me give you this. Cut to the face. <laughs> <laughs> Appears in my hand. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> I will say, though, like the one good thing about hand stuff is you can often do blends, which is quite nice. Like a lot mm -hmm. of the time you don't need each individual pose. Like mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I know someone who's working on a project where they're trying to do a uh, animated piano player and they're talking to a real piano player for how like how do you actually play them and for these particular notes and scales and where would your hand rest in these positions? And 
you can actually approximate a lot of it by doing mm -hmm. transitional poses and phase. And it's like, because there is human flourishes you won't get right, but you can get 70% of the way there. And I think back to games which have things where characters would hold objects. There's actually a few assets on the asset store, which you can show a capsule. And then when you um, place an object in the hand, if you rotate the hand, it'll just find, using ray casting, it'll find points to place the fingers that will have a semi-accurate holding pose for that object um so there's lots of ways to do it but oftentimes in most cases you can literally get away with uh you know grabbing a small object grabbing a large object <laughs> having various points you can get away with a lot of basics you know and if you go fast mm -hmm. enough no one will notice true <laughs> there, there are several points in your animation that, that may look very bad because you have the gods that by view and you can see where it breaks if the user doesn't see it it might be good enough professionally yep. clean these up for your use case, if you just need an animation, good enough is good enough. Yeah. Cut cut make do your 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 third person view to cut off the feet. And then you don't need to worry about feet sliding. Hell, <laughs> not even uh right. like Pixar, for example, has the classic scene with like Woody and Buzz standing next to each other. Woody's foot feet are clipping through the floor, but it makes for a better shot. Hide it, cheat the shot. Yeah, it really is one of those like it is worth knowing what's worth the energy. Um like it's it's one of those things like if you ever actually think about it, the, this goes back to I've said before about doing magic and magic tricks and stuff. Uh, one of the most fun things about doing magic tricks is if you do a trick for somebody, um, there's a couple of things you can do called priming where you will set up a set of rules in advance that describe a scenario. And then when you're done, people will rewrite the story and as they tell it to others without going into a whole lot of nitty gritty details. The, one example is there's like, one trick out of a set of 20 might require the deck to be in a shuffled order. And so you might at some stage do a swap to a deck that's fully shuffled in a certain way. And then you would middle of your trick talking, you'd do a false shuffle and you'd hand them the deck. Um, and you'd say at halfway through when the trick is past the point that it matters and tell them to shuffle again. My point is halfway through a trick with a shuffle deck, you would say shuffle the deck again. And when they tell that story to somebody else, I've been at the bar watching someone tell someone else about a trick I did and they they will tell the story like first I shuffled the deck then they did the trick then they handed it back and I shuffled again and so their version of events has changed because you primed them to do so and so my point with the animation stuff is if you go back and play a lot of games and ask yourself which games have animations for picking things up you'll actually get it wrong a lot of the time if you watch the games a lot of games will do at best vague hand gesture towards thing and then it appears inventory because mm -hmm. at the moment your hand reaches out the icon pops up and if someone's done the ui job right your eye will move from hand to pop up and you won't even be really processing the finalization of the grabbing of the object or a handover you um, hear a sound so, instead <laughs> yeah, yeah so flash of light exactly so it comes down to like where should that energy go and oftentimes the answer is like this stuff you don't need shrinking horse testicles in your game let's put it that way right like that's not a it's not a priority for, for most feature maybe not in your game movie. yeah <laughs> every every game does need those but i think the big takeaway here for everybody is you can't trust your memory mm -hmm. let's make a horse testicle simulator game <laughs> It'd probably be like number one on Steam, knowing the way things go. Put it up on, submit it for Discord. You know, it would be. No, no, that's my submission. Yeah. All right. No, it, it would. It, it, I mean, it would. you'll get 30K just to develop it. <laughs> <laughs> the most realistic hydraulics, okay? Um, but yeah, cheating, um, your brain will do a lot of gap work. For instance, when you watch something with subtitles, you don't remember the original language it was in because you don't know the language. You're going to subconsciously remember that scene in the tone of voice with whatever words you were reading. You don't yeah. remember. Ah, yes, Somebody exactly watches exactly a lot of anime. Is. Yes. All right. <laughs> I leave card out in front. And hey, that's how you know you can cheat heavily. I mean, you're basically using using uh, the, the player's brain as an external GPU, right? Mm -hmm. To process stuff that isn't there. If you give them the two keyframes, they're going to fill in the blanks with their own brain. I mean, that's what our brains do all the time with our own inputs. So we're primed to fill in the blanks with with uh, new 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 memories, essentially fake memories. Everything's fake. Exactly, it's all a matter of your perception. Offload yeah. some of that memory to the user. Don't yeah. cause them to stack overflow, though. That's the willing suspension of disbelief being. Broken. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's that's why we have special hospitals. <laughs> Can I add more GPU to my user? Okay, because I'm I'm feeling a little lazy today. I, I need think to do some problems. Elon Musk is around, working yeah. on that with his chimp uh, test, right? Hey, it was in a human. We okay. got, got humans with starlings now. But you don't have one yet, Andrew. Oh, I would never get one from his companies. Trust me. 
Oh, no. Let me just take you on a little trip. That sounds extremely <laughs> dangerous. No, it's on, it, I, I tend to agree. So you guys ready to get on to uh, tips? Well, we've been talking about Ooh. the uh, testicles, so let's just do the tips. Yeah. <laughs> just the tips this time. Well, let's move on. So we're going to get back to doing um, a little tip of the week. I've got something. I don't know if you guys all have something. Um, get ready. Just something useful that uh, all the developers can take with them going forward. So... Corvallis, I, I did gave you almost zero warning. So, do you want to go first or last? Hell, let's do. Let's go first. I love diving right in. Uh, right. Tip of the week for animation: Learn what a control rig is, and remember, these do not translate between your programs. If you are doing a three D animation, by all means, use something that easily lets you be able to retarget these animations as well. It'll save you a lot of pain. And it'll save you a lot of cleanup. Do so, and when you translate them to a game engine, it should work. Should being the big asterisk there. If you do a good job with your cleanup and you're set up in like Blender, it should work just fine in other areas. So don't be afraid of Brent. I can't speak. Don't be afraid of Blender. Be be knowledgeable. Take your knowledge to your own hands and learn what a control rig is. Do not. Can you give like the control. elevator pitch for what a control rig is? Sure. So that way they've got an idea arm, of what they're going to look up. Yeah. When you move your arm, your forearm doesn't just move. It moves with the rest of your body. Your shoulder moves back, your hand moves back, etc. A computer doesn't know this by default. When you move your forearm bone, only that bone moves. Maybe something attached to it, but nothing before it. A control rig is meant to mimic more human motion. So you have things related to FK and IK, forward and inverse kinematics, not going to dive into it, but these will save you a lot of time animating. So that way you're not moving things bone by bone. You can instead move a hand and get a very realistic human movement. And with that, you can make an animation quicker and you should be able to retarget an animation. So just transfer it over to another humanoid. Humanoids are generally pretty predictable. So working with that allows you to keep your animations effective across multiple multiple different meshes and rigs. Nice. And where would you recommend people go to to learn a little bit more and try to figure that stuff out? They want to get in and become better at the animating. Are there any like resources you'd send them to? Does Blender have docs or somebody else? Uh, Blender themselves have a healthy amount of docs. Personally, I'm very ghetto with how I learn. I, I bootstrap everything from a collection of YouTube videos for, oh, hey, this works. <laughs> uh, here's... So this would have been a pitch I could have given two weeks ago, but I can't quite do now, was Cascador was really great at this, and still is, where if I just pop in like a humanoid model, they have an auto-rigger built in where you don't really, you really need to think much. It'll just set it up so that way you have both FK and IK movement. But recently, their free plan has changed where you can't export back out for free. So it kind of makes the point moot of you can't get your model back out with the completed animation, like an FBX format. Now, Does that include the new format. thing that they just did where they released that like free one or two year plan for students? Oh, it's for students as well. Okay, then yeah, if you're a student, by all means do this. But yeah, it's part of that plan restructuring. If you oh. bring it in account with them before March, you can get like two years of their normal plan for free. So you can still use it as you can. Okay. But yeah, if other than that, definitely search on YouTube. There are plenty of programs that you can invest in. I believe um, AutoRig Pro is like a paid one for Blender. That's very easy for you to set up auto rigs. I found it's a retargeter, very good as well. There are also free ones like Rigify. So things that are meant to help you set up a rig in Blender and give you that control rig power. That's free, totally usable as well. And of course, third-party plugins that do something similar or something more specific for your use case. By all means, look into these, but just remember the control rig is for you to set up animations. It will not work once it leaves whatever program you set it up in. So these bones do nothing when like transfer to Unity. They only care about the form, the underlying deformation bones in their movement. So animate on control rigs, transfer them away, and shuffle them away elsewhere. Okay, that sounds interesting. So um, if you can send me those links too to some of those tools that you mentioned other than Cascader, I've got that one. I'd love to just put those in the description. Uh, I think that would be helpful for people. And Andrew, it looks like you've got uh, I, I something got already ready to share and show. So this is what I've learned this week. I've learned some things this week. And so I was going to, yeah. I, so when you said, let's do tips, I'm like, yes, I got it. Um, so I'm working on this whole projectile system. And as many of you know, I like making very pretty inspectors that make it easier to, to manage data. 
So one of the things I, I learned today, if I go to, to this spawn modification, um, well, this isn't actually, I didn't just learn this, but this, uh, little, this is an editor script. Um, I'm going to go into writer and we'll show the, the spawn modification editor. It's an object called spawn modification. And, and I should have brought this one up. I didn't bring this one up. Uh, and I wanted to have, uh, uh, the link to the docs here at the top and a little bit more information, but I didn't want to make a full custom editor because sometimes that's overkill. And so, and in this case, there's just too many versions. There's no way I'm going to do that. And so yeah. it, you can make a custom editor that only has one additional thing, like just the link to your docs or just the link to a reminder or something else simply by, by doing an editor. So you're going to do a custom editor, you know, ask the AI how to do it or, or Google it. Um, for in this case, it's a custom editor for the spawn behavior modification is this the size. Yeah, it looks like it's a good size. Um, and then on your inspector GUI, you just do all this regular stuff that you all the cool custom stuff that you want to do, and then just draw a default inspector, which is really oh. uh, well, I mean, I, I've got my own helper scripts, so it's a little bit more complicated, but it's eventually just say, um, draw a default inspector somewhere in here. Um, yeah, it's where is it? Wait a minute. Why is it so complicated? It's extra complicated because I've I've made it. You've got a property made. fill for it. The other thing you can do is call like the go. base on Inspector GUI. Yeah. Um, we'll also do that. Yeah. Ask the AI for the simple version. I'm doing a lot more because I'm also saving things and doing other yeah. things. But um, you can do a very simple uh, uh, bonus inspector and then add new stuff. That was one thing I learned. But I learned two things that go in well together. Uh, that were brand new to me this week. So when I when I go to these uh, to this this inspector for this projectile object, there's a lot going on here. There's these behaviors, modifications, all these different behaviors, and each behavior has different options. They do different things. They make the projectile work in different ways. And the mm -hmm. way this works is that each one of these is a scriptable object. So there's all these different scriptable objects, and each one will have slightly different settings. So you can have a setting that makes it go to the right, one that goes to the left, one that goes up, and all these different things for your different projectiles. So I wanted to be able to see the values in my inspector and change them without having to go to each uh, individual object. Because if you're like me, you hate having to switch inspector views back and forth and then forget which one you were on and have to go search for it. Very big headache. So I learned that you can create custom attributes. Now I knew you could create custom attributes, but I had never done it before. Um, so that's, that's, that's the first thing I learned. And if I look at my spawn behavior class here, you can see that in addition to the tool tips, which I always use, in addition to the min values and the ranges that you should be using for, for uh, reasonable inputs so that people don't mess up and get, do something crazy, I have this new show in projectile editor uh, attribute with even a field label that gives me what the text will show. And all this is, is, is uh, this one little script here. It's a new class for that. It's a system attribute. Um, we have our, our string here. And uh, when we call that attribute, we just have this little bit of text. And then the editor does, does the rest. And I'll show that in a second. What's interesting about this is this is the surface. I've just done, I've scratched a little bit on the surface. Mm -hmm. I am sure there's a hell of a lot more I could do with this if, if I had my wits about me, right? Um, but the implement the impl implementation of this um, is quite simple. You just put that there uh, above the the thing. And actually, I, I, I um, the actual thing I was going to show is the spawn B or yeah the modification editor. Um, no, not that one. So, but anyways, we use it here, and then it, it pops out. And now I've got my little drop down here that shows all these values. The tooltips are shown right here. If there's a tooltip attribute, then I can show that. It's another editor script. Mm -hmm. The headers get shown here as well. Um, and the, the the string I used in, in the code uh, is, is this value right here. So now I can control the string and make it as human readable as I want. And so if the, if the um, pro property is named something that's not quite what I want it to be when displayed here, I can control that. The interesting thing is when I when I change things here, it actually changes it on the scriptable object. So that's a that's a good and bad thing. 
but when you when you and I've got these links to go back and forth too because I don't like having to find objects. But mm -hmm. that way, um, if you do change something here, you can it changes it on all the objects because you're not actually changing the um, you know the 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 bullet blue here. You're actually changing the bullet blue impact or the bullet impact blue. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So attributes is the main takeaway here. They're interesting. They're probably way more powerful than I'm showcasing here. And uh, I suspect in my future, there will be many more. Attributes. This is why I tell everybody to use Odin because it's uh, what you've built here is one of the attributes in there. The uh, uh, oh, really? in, inline inline editor or yeah inline inspector or editor one of those two yeah gives you exactly that functionality it's uh very very handy and i use it all the time so <laughs> you yeah. definitely found a useful thing to recreate for sure um i mean obviously you can't just ship odin with your stuff so it makes sense in here, but that, that's super useful I, I was telling you the other day i've never used odin i've owned odin for a very long time i've never actually used it because yeah I can't unfortunately maybe one day I use it in everything, so I know. it's interesting. Well, um, I was going to go over to story next, but my um, my thing is very similar, very related to yours, so I think maybe I'll, I'll show that first real quick. Go for um, it. The line, Jason, but we accept it. Let me pull it up here. So there we go. Is it showing? It is. There it okay. Is. Uh, it is showing, right. though, yes. For a while, it so, was blurry. Yeah, I've been working on the um, on this game and I've been doing a lot of debugging. So it, I, I'll show you real quick what it looks like now. Here's the ladybug. You can run around and go uh, go kick other ladybugs. You can turn into a mimic and give them a lick, or you can like uh, oh, whoops, I killed her. Let's go find another another ladybug. To, ah, what have I done? Well, well, you I did say everything. you were debugging, and yeah. I saw a bug in your game. So there was a bug there. Now, what I've got here, and that's actually perfect, what I wanted to show is when I'm debugging these things, one of the little tricks that I like to use is to add um, a custom inspector. So I've got that NP, that player here, right here, this player. No, where is he at? Uh, where's my character? Ooh. Is my character destroyed? Let's see. So okay, well, them. normally I've got my character and I go select them and then I look at the data for them. But what I was going to show you is um, the way that I usually go about doing that is I'll add a little inspector for the object that's very similar to what you have that shows all of the data right at the top. So here I can see the current state that any one of my creatures are in. Um, if my player hadn't destroyed itself, I'd be able to see that too. I, I know why it destroyed itself. I just changed something with the interaction stuff. Um, but I can see the roles that it's got, the abilities that it has, the cooldowns, all of the stats and stuff without having to click around or do anything special. It only shows up in the editor. It's editor-only code, and it works with a very simple... Um, let me switch the share real quick. A very simple script that I spend zero effort on but helps me debug immensely, and that looks like this so I, like i said yours reminded me a lot of uh what i was doing so there's a, an editor inspector for a type and then it has the on inspector gui and then in here you just go through and add in a little label for all of the different data that i care about and then at the end there's the base on inspector gui right here which makes it do the normal inspector so right at the top i can see all of the debug data that i want for any character go click on them it gets compiled out at run at like build time, so I don't have to worry about any performance issues there or even ripping it out. It's just there all the time. I can go click on the NPCs, see all of their data, and it's very simple to add stuff. If I want to go add any extra info, and I just go add basically a little label field entry here. It makes it, like I said, super fast for debugging and stops me from having to do as much attaching breakpoints and trying to figure stuff out if I don't know the state of things, especially when there are lots of things where the state is moving constantly. Another trick that I like to use with that too is so um, on things where I'm trying to figure out why it's making a decision or what's going on, a lot of the time I'll do a simple setup like this where I give the thing a message field that I can mm -hmm. fill in with info if I want. And then what I'll usually do is like, at release time, 
you can just rip that out because it's just a couple of useless allocations. But before that, even at release time, you could change it over to be some constants or something. But um, the way that that works is if you look here, if I go find some of the usages, um, here's the, the brain trying to figure out what, what it's got for a target, why it's making decisions. And it'll just give a little update there. And I can see that inside the inspector, see exactly what's going on. Again, mostly just for super fast iteration debugging and speeding things up so that I, I know what why all my things are doing what they're doing and there's it's, it's almost a zero effort thing you just go create a custom editor override the on inspector gui add whatever data you want and then call on inspector gui at the end and then i just do that on that kind of top level object for the thing i care about and i can rip it out add it you know, it takes me a good 30 seconds to add one so that was just uh, something that I realized that I do a lot and people probably don't know about. People probably go, like, hey, if you're going and looking at debug properties and right-clicking the you know show properties and then going into debug mode and trying to find all that stuff, much easier if you just spam it out there. And it's also a lot easier than putting it into console logs where you're trying to figure out what's going on with things. Console logs are great for like one-off events, but not so much for data tracking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Much so. more efficient logging. That way you don't need to actually use the console. Just look at the object. Yeah. <laughs> that's 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 the goal at least. Um but yeah, that was uh that was my little tip there. Hopefully it's useful for people. I'm able to use that in your own stuff. Also for the students, let me find that little link here. Uh put putting the code up today for that project. So if you want to go see the actual code that um i put it up for the multiplayer mastery course students before there's a previous version and I put up the new version of the code so you'd be able to see that and strip that out or um all of the other code side stuff the assets obviously can't put in there but um it would be nice if i just owned everything and could just ship the assets too but <laughs> <laughs> andrew are you frozen no you're animating behind no I'm it's great because i was like is andrew frozen no he's staring because his light is changing <laughs> oh, yeah. I can't pretend yeah, it. So it moves in the background but yeah that, that was my tip hopefully it's helpful for people um, I've got a lot more from this project coming up for the next couple of weeks so story I'm excited this um, is going to be a good yeah. one right life changing like on brand. Well, so seeing, as you're, seeing as you're talking about editor tooling I might as well join in um, the first one is actually something uh, your I found because I was actually trying to figure it out and I couldn't find a good solution which is if you use uh, Andrew was talking about the properties, custom properties and property attributes. Um, one thing you'll find if you apply a property attribute to an array is the attribute will apply to every child element of the array. So if I make a property drawer and it's meant to change a certain element, let's say a string makes it read only or something, and I apply it, it'll apply to every child element in the array, which is cool. That's like a pretty quick automatic feature you can't modify the entire collection. If you wanted to like paint every element in the array red or something, you couldn't modify the collection, or in my case, make it a um, paginated, the actual array itself or something. Or at least that's what I thought. There's actually a constructor override for called apply, uh, apply to multiple or something, uh, apply to collection. And so basically if you extend the default property attribute and pass in a Boolean flag, you can basically modify how the actual array itself draws, which can be quite useful if you're doing, in my case, an array of textures, I was turning it into a grid, so it was a bit nicer to draw. Um, that's one. And the other one I think I just learned today actually is, uh, I know you make good use of these, Andrew, is the, the scroll view that lets you like have a region that you basically begin and end and have a scrollable mm -hmm. section of your own stuff. What I didn't realize is actually there's an overload of that function, which takes in two rects. One rect represents the actual drawn region that's like locked. And the second rect is the content size region, which acts the same way as a content size fitter. What that means is, is you can take in an array of objects that you're about to render in a scroll rect. You can calculate the max height by multiplying per item size by total, and then generate a secondary rect inside of it, draw that, and then only draw the child elements, and then capture the index for the scroll and index into the appropriate array. Long story short, you can actually create a scroll region of thousands of items, but actually only show 11 at a time and do the same level of pooling as you would do with anything else, uh, which 
not even Unity does, because if you have an array of a thousand elements, Unity will start to chug <laughs> very quickly. So you can actually avoid that problem yourself by just creating your own scroll rects that are, um, you know, auto pooling 14 yeah. items or 12 items or something. So I only learned that today when I was, because I normally what I do is I make a paginator. I like literally only draw a certain set, you know, use the skip and take functions in link to just grab a page size. Uh, but then you have to manage pages and have like page buttons and stuff. And it's just easier to say, hey, actually, we can have a collection that is all of the items, thousands and thousands, and, um, you know, do that. Because I was, I was doing some tests last week on large data sets. Um, and to probably no one's surprise, if you try to read a file that's a, a billion lines long, you'll run out of system memory. So that doesn't work. So I was trying to... Well, don't do that. Yeah. No, yeah, I, I knew that. I wanted to see like where would the cap be and what would happen on my machine. And I started looking at different solutions and how I might handle uh, mapped page files and indexing mm -hmm. into files, which, by the way, that's a whole other topic I could cover if we're talking about tips. Um, the say JSON files. One thing that people often do is if they have a collection of items like pickups in your game, they'll just use a normal JSON file. JSON files are fine, but what you don't have is random access. If you wanted to mm -hmm. just load item 15 and you know it's item 15 in the file, you have to read the whole file into memory to get item 15, mm -hmm. um, yep. which is fine if you've got 200 items. If you've got 10,000 or in this case, 1 billion items in a file, I literally can't even read to an item without having to like do something with all the memory. Mm -hmm. um, and so you have to basically iterate through. And and by the way, when I say a billion items, like I have like 128 gig of RAM, like I've got a yeah. relatively decent uh, chunking machine. Um, it should be in a binary format though, if you're gonna force that much data. You should avoid yes, well, JSON. <laughs> yes, you can. But, but the, the, the kind of a stopgap solution, if you're not familiar with kind of going into that whole make your own formats, BSON is what I actually use for those. But um, is you can use what's called JSON lines, which basically means if your JSON format is actually lists of items, there's no reason to make an object which is like a hierarchical structure, which requires you to read the hierarchical structure. If you just write each line as a JSON object in its entirety, mm -hmm. then you can just say, read line seven. And suddenly you can just jump mm -hmm. straight to line seven, read that line in. So in the case where I find myself storing a list of items exclusively into a JSON file, uh, I won't make a JSON object with an array. I will literally just write JSON lines one by one into the thing. And that way I can have it. And I order them first. So you order them, store them. And that way you can basically do things like lookups and searches without having to store the whole lot in memory. And you can get one step further by doing something called, again, memory mapped files or similar, which basically lets you um, directly map a space in memory to a file and then index into it. And then you can start a parallel thread because each one is a separate line now. And you can run through all of the lines in parallel till you find what you want, add it to a concurrency bag, and then grab the results out of that. And that's vastly faster than you'd get out of individual runs. Um, yeah. Kind of oh, the kind ideal is still just load the whole thing in memory if you can. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. If you, if you like can, a, if you for, can, yeah. for nine out of 10 problems, you just want to throw the whole thing in RAM because there's not enough enough data there to, to matter. But yeah, it's more it's more about knowing what's happening yeah. in the context of doing knowing that. that it's there. Stuff, you know. Now, yeah. uh, you, you called out color things real quick. I wanted, I noticed um, that Color Studio is the free asset of the week on publishers thing. Have you, is this one you tried? Uh, I don't think I've tried that. It's one. by Connect, and I know everybody likes Connect. Mm. Um, but it's cool. one of those tools for managing colors. Is that? Mm -hmm. I was curious what your thoughts were on um, on that whole thing because you've talked about it a little bit and I, I, talking I about setting up the color schemes with the with the tooling. Um, are there other tools that you've used for setting that up, or like what's? Is there, I, I'm just kind of curious. Is like if you want to do a good color scheme, is this something you would do, or you do something totally different? Um, I guess you go grab it and try it out. <laughs> it's free right now. If everybody I, watching, I mean, click the link, go grab it for free. Use the uh, the code. Apparently, on there. I already own it, so apparently, I have picked it up at some point. Me too. Um, yeah, yeah. So, color is interesting. Yes, it looks like a good asset, and it certainly seems like it. It's covered all the stuff that you'd want from something like this. It has. Um, is it worth it at the price of free, though? I I, I think it's pretty clear. <laughs> it's free. Um, I would say though that. Um, the, the concepts behind this, it's like all of this stuff, right? It comes down to the question of like, would you need an asset for it? What are you doing it with or whatever? Or, or how many features would you use out of it? At the mm -hmm. end of the day, um, 
all these color assets boil down to there's like six different ways to represent color, whether you're doing RGB or hue, saturation and lightness or whichever, or YM. So you can depend on, are you doing it for print? Are you doing it for screen? You know, various different uh, things, which all come down to like how it renders and different stuff. But most of these are kind of color rules to make things look better. Um, if you struggle with that stuff, something like this can be quite good because you can grab um, a base color and then say, make me a split complementary and it'll automatically pick two colors on the opposing side of the wheel for you that match roughly together um, and then has all the other nice rules for it. A lot of these though are really sort of, it's it's literally a circle and it's like they're set equations that'll grab something on the appropriate side. So yeah. all of these can be one line equations. So if you are writing like an automator for yourself, you can often just like, I have an asset, so I have my own script somewhere with like a couple of lines of code, which do 90% of what I want, which will like, you know, convert a color to hue, saturation, lightness, and then do a saturation divider across multiple things to get like a gradiated portion and then save out the, like each of these things I use frequently enough that I have little helper functions for already. But yeah, I do think it's um, it's a useful thing to have. And it's, it's not that difficult either. Like it's each of these are... And, and you don't even need to memorize them either. Like a lot of these, if you don't even want to use specific assets, there's a million websites. Um, there's I have like at least 10 that I use semi-regularly between Adobe Color and um, there's uh, uh, things like Low Spec and Color Lover and various other websites that all have hmm. a color hunt. And each of these websites will have different palettes organized by uh, moods or eras or uh, certain ones, certain games or pixel art or... Yeah, Co color is a big topic. I could literally talk about color for a <laughs> very long time. Yeah, yeah, we should do like a full show about it sometime. Get get a pal in here too. It's more artistic. Um, so let's see, Andrew. Oh yes, you've got uh, something you've been working on, and I think would be interesting to share. You want to tell everybody what it is, real quick? Yeah, so I've been working on this projectile system. My thing was I needed art arrows for my game. So I also figured I would need other things for my game. Suddenly, because I'm doing a demo, the camera's flying away. And that's actually because I am uh, used a prefab and then I saved the prefab in another scene. So let me just turn that off. Um, that wasn't supposed to happen, but it's the obligatory demo. That's the not the worst thing. So I wanted a, a projectile system, but projectiles are kind of annoyingly hard in the end because I want one that's flexible and that I can control one that I knew I had no idea what I'm going to want in the future. And I wanted to use a lot of stuff from the asset store because the particles on the asset store are amazing. So I made this projectile yep. system that essentially allows uh, a, a spawner to have all these different projectiles. And as I was showing earlier, you set these up in the inspector and they're all behavior based. Mm -hmm. Meaning, like this bullet blue right now looks like this. It's really Ooh, cool. Good juice, good feedback. Yeah, huh? And and that's that's really neat. But the, the the cool thing about it is, I can go to the spawn behavior. Right now, we're using this machine gun fast. We can switch this to the machine gun three shots fast. And now, when we press play, well, it's too fast, but it's paying out three shots at once. Uh, <laughs> actually, I should show a better one. There's five at forty five degrees. Here we go. This one is much more visual. Um, if, if you're swapping out to do demos, I'd turn off the um, uh, what you call it the recompile code base because you can then just quickly test these as you're you know without uh -huh. having to reweight the thing. I'll have to uh, I'll have to you have to show me what that what that is. But here we go. Now we got five going out. Nice. And it's a different Ooh. speed, and this is just controlled by this machine gun thing right here. And all you have to do is change the the angle here. And I don't know if this works. At, oh, it does work at runtime. So it should. Now, yeah. Mm -hmm. So now you can change the angle and adjust that. You can do instead, you can do 10, and then now it's spitting out 10. You can do all sorts of different things. And the cool thing is that um, you can code your own, too. So you can use these ones that are... That are um, you, you know what would make for a really good example? Yeah. Um, you could add a script that basically sine waves that number between two values over time, and you'd get like a nice cascading wave of your bullets. There you go. See, it's literally the one line of code. It's mathf dot sine, and yeah. you'd multiply it by your min max, and you'd get like a sinusoidal wave of bullets, which would be pretty cool. So that you can do a lot of different things. And so I've been making all these particles, and I've been updating it to work with all sorts of whoops, 
the laser beams too. Um, though that, that one wasn't really working. Um, with all these particles from these particle packs, because they're just really fun and they look prettier than my dev ones. Um, yes, they do. <laughs> they do. And, there's a, and you can add all these behaviors. So this one has a behavior. This is one of my favorite ones where it just shoots out. Then it goes looking for a target. And when it hits the target, it spawns this other thing. And this other thing has forces on it. So it kind of like holds things into a force field. And oh. all of this is just done with behaviors. And so these behaviors, you can mix and match them between different pro projectiles you can replace them very easily. They all do basically one thing. There's a ray cast hit detector, an impact, move forward, because you got to move, right? Mm -hmm. um, destroy on trigger. There's just a lot you can do with it, and it's very easy to, to kind of build projectiles. So that's what I've been working on. And I've been making, this is, this is using the projectiles from Arcanor uh, Sci-Fi Effects or Sci-Fi Arsenal. Um, but I've been, I've been doing integrations for all sorts of things. So this is the cartoon, uh, effects remastered and uh, the camera might end up moving too on this one. Um, so this again, just different projectiles, same concept, but with different particles essentially. And it works nice. with any particle system in the end. Um, but what I found in doing this is, you know, publisher set their, their particles very differently. So there's a couple that took me a, a long time to to convert over. Um, Forge 3D Sci-Fi Effects is an amazing particles. They look great. They sound great. They they've got these amazing turrets that are just perfect for so many games. But it took me four hours to convert these yeah. over Ooh. <laughs> because they I remember so those ones having a lot of scripts. A lot of scripts. They had the names of the particles in the scripts. Yeah. yeah. So you could not use them without converting them essentially or building the particles from scratch, which was a shame. So I ended up building the particles from scratch. I um, redid a lot of code, uh, but now we've got these cool particles that do cool things and they sound cool. They look cool. They, they're powerful and I'm going to use these in, in my games. It looks great, man. Awesome. I'm, I'm jealous of uh, your visuals. <laughs> it, you, the, a lot of the, I mean, it's just post-processing for, for the yeah. visuals and, and, and all that. But um, I just think it's really fun that like this, this is, is another great example. These are the same projectile. This one does just back and forth. No big deal. And then mm -hmm. this one has a behavior that shoots them out at a different rate. And also they're, got a little chaos in the in the trajectory so there it you know randomizes the trajectory a little bit so you could just change one behavior and change everything um mm -hmm. so that's it that's 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 my show um it's nice awesome. and where can everybody check that thing out and grab it you can check it out on the asset store when it comes out it's not out yet i'm still finalizing it um i'm i'm working on the documentation because i like making really nice docs i passed it to wyman the other day and he said don't tell me anything about it let me just give you all my complaints so i'm waiting for his his, his novella to come back yes, with uh, I've, I've got a few um, um, yes um so I, i'm basically dog fooding it um a little bit first making the documentation fixing any bugs, doing refactors. I'll listen to what Jason has to say, and maybe I'll do a few things based on that. And then uh, then I'll release it on the asset store, and it will be part of my game as well because I wanted to shoot arrows, and then I realized I also was going to want fireballs and also probably lasers from the flying eyes <laughs> and probably all sorts of other things I don't know I want yet. And so I figured, let me build a flexible behavior-based projectile system. That, I guess um a question I have is how difficult was it to hook up particles from entirely different systems? So I know you mentioned Forge was by far yeah. the hardest, but what, how, like on average, how difficult would you say a new particle hookup is? It, so the, I would say the Arcanor ones are a dream to work with because they're literally set up. There's a fly and I, they're literally That's set up. What, as, I had to a, show it. <laughs> as a muzzle, a particle, a projectile itself and the impact. So there's three different things. And that's the dream because you just have three different behaviors and you're done. Um, mm -hmm. And they they already have uh, movement on them. If you want, you can not use them, or you can. It doesn't or they work. I assume work fine if you move them around. The trails look good and it works, right? Everything, like, yes, yeah. everything. It's just it's very much more easy to set up. Yeah. Um, the the most difficult ones were that Forge three D one because the scripts you just had to either figure it out yourself with the base components, which weren't easily, they weren't the best organized mm -hmm. or convert their scripts, which took me about five hours to do. Um, mm -hmm. 
And the the other one, which kind of annoyed me because I've always looked at it and loved it, is the realistic effects pack four. I was going to ask you that one because the there that's an interesting case where yeah. as an end user they're really good because they're very drag and drop prefabs. But for what you're trying to do, each one is an isolated prefab, which means yes. you would have to as you. So I, I was actually picturing that one in particular as you were saying it. I was like, switch that back one to my is, screen. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Jason. Yep. Yeah. 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 So yes. Uh, I've converted this one as well, and it looks great. I added a lot more to their demo scene because I want things to move uh, and show the nice little forces and all that, and it works well. The The crazy thing about this one, though, is the the big trick since these are these are so these are set up very differently than any other projectile that you expect that you can't preview the projectiles They're very standalone you literally just instantiate and say off you go maybe set a target at best yep. yeah but the big trick for all these projectiles i'll show them real quick um we got our actor here we got our effects here the big thing is the helper turn on object at spawn all i'm doing for these I, I did re rework them a little bit and my inspector's not showing it. Oh yeah, it is. Um, what's it turning on? Oh, let me open the prefab. Um, we got the effect. All we're doing is turning it on because these trigger when you turn them on, they have all these other custom scripts on them. RFX for effect settings. The collisions have these physics motions. And if you, if you turn these scripts off, they don't work, right? They will not work if you turn them off. And what I realized is that meant I couldn't really use them. But the one thing was, if you just turn the whole object on, the effect fires off just once. I'm mm -hmm. like, well, if we can do that. So now the system basically has the projectile. And it has the things like adding forces, add, do destroy and trigger, do the, you can do custom scripts to add damage. When the demo scenes do a lot of that where they actually add damage. So you can see how that's done. But the big trick here is just, oh, when it spawns, turn it on. And that <laughs> makes the actual effect fire off. The rest is just the logic of how to handle the effect in, 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 in your game. And that matches all the other projectiles. So you can end up embedding them. But depending on the uh, particles you have, you might need one or two custom little trick scripts. In this case, a trick script is just turning on the damn particle. Yeah, because I was thinking you'd probably need something because the other big thing I noticed with their kit is there's a clean delineation between um, auto aiming ones versus ones that have targets because yeah. a lot mm -hmm. of heat seeking type stuff. And so you're you'd need to support that as well. You'd either because other, otherwise people are going to have to assign the targets to their script separate from your thing. But I'd imagine you'd probably want a behavior in your system that would allow that to just basically transfer the transform from your as in a target from your system into the appropriate bullet because that could be quite easy that would just be having some helper to say target object and then you would basically query for their script and pass it in right but i think that's an important one to add because that's a pretty common occurrence where a system would have a targeted object or a target collection or something you know yep and and why why i do like method i know sometimes uh custom like saying oh you can make your own custom scripts you can make an override that scares some people um, who are newer to it, but it's a very powerful thing because it does mean you can say, oh, I really like how this one behavior works. Let me make a slightly different modification, override it, change one line, and now you've got your own custom thing. And the other thing is in, in the inspector here, I've got these very bright um, uh, console debugs. I know that I've been, they've been hurting my eyes since you yeah, said they, this. They, they hurt your eyes. On I purpose. regret, I regret the day I ever showed you ah. how to color. <laughs> uh, it's true. Story it's, did uh... teach me the color thing, but the reason why they're so bright is because these, these are demo scripts for the actors. And you know, one of the big things that people will always face is great. I've got a fireball. How do I make it actually cause damage? Problem is, everyone's damage unless you're using game modules and even if you're using my game modules it's going to be different per project i don't know how you do damage i don't know your math on damage nobody can do that for you and you should have your own because it's your game so this is basically a demo script showing how to how to actually take a thing the projectile and cause damage uh, in the demo we have a, just a, a basic damage value in that's attached to all the projectiles and the projectile data and then it just registers the hit. So this is, I'm not going to walk through it, but this is where mm -hmm. people would go to be like, oh, 
I see the actor just caused damage. Oh, I see the um, target just took damage. And really, each each one of these um, each one of these uh, projectiles has a projectile data on it. And these projectile data right now just have speed and damage. And ultimately, you, you're gonna you're gonna oh, this is the damage over time one. But ultimately, you're gonna make your own version of projectile data that will have your own logic for the calculate damage. I got and a, a want, question for you, Andrew. Yeah. Um, do you expose Unity events for when these things happen so that the oh. people who don't know how to code and don't really understand overriding abstract classes or whatever um, um, can get in there and tie things in? I feel like it obviously for like me and you and Story and Corvallis and stuff yeah. and probably at least half the people watching doing a class is probably an easy setup. But I feel like there's probably a lot of people out there, um, like I said, I talked to proto factor dude is an animator building games using assets a lot of drag drop type stuff and if mm -hmm. you had events like that is that something that's available like an on impact and they could just hook up their their damage from their health you know whatever health system they're using has a take damage method and they could just pass that in or is, is there something like that yes there are all these events perfect um, okay. okay there are all these events and so all the behaviors automatically they are all, those all, unity events or just events uh what's the difference the unity, unity events, events show up in the inspector, inspector so you can go assign oh, stuff to no, them. they are not unity of events you should uh, add a layer of those uh, okay. I, I, maybe as a optional thing like as a an extra script or something but i okay. would at least consider it for um, all the people that don't know how to write code or the designers that are going in and maybe it's already yeah. hooked up to do damage. They want mm -hmm. to add in some extra visual effects and all that stuff. But I think more so for the people who want to use like your projectile system with some other health system. In that fact, I would probably go grab a couple of those health systems and do, do the integration yourself with um, some of the more popular ones. Cause yeah. it'd be pretty easy. And like with a you know, single th things like RPG builder, do an integration into their, their stats and show you know how you can do that easily with unity events and not do any extra code ideally you can just have like a, a little demo or something yeah so we do yeah I'll, I'll look into that because it makes sense i've, I've got everything is event based um you've got all these different life cycle events that you can tap into there's also um a a global so the camera actually has a my mouse has to be blown on every once in a while to work um <laughs> the, of course the, me too yeah <laughs> Wait. Um, so the 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 camera shake on projectile collision is is uh is a neat script it's um a global observer and a global observer basically registers with the factory manager and the factory manager is a static scriptable object you don't even need it in the scene it just always works and yeah. the factory manager looks at every single projectile and it knows what every projectile is doing. So a global mm -hmm. observer can tap into that and then do things when any projectile does things. So the camera. Oh yeah. Projectile... Unity events for that would be nice too, that you yeah. could just hook into on the factory. Yeah. That makes sense too. See? Mm -hmm. So um, there you go. So there's lots of ways to hook into the events. There's also another thing you can put on a game object that just can then, you know, you can, you can attach to a spawner. Uh, or red, link it to a spawner and say, watch every single projectile that comes out of this spawner. So if you're, if mm -hmm. you're, um, you know, you're very interested in your player, for instance, and in, in doing something there, you can just watch that spawner and then see every projectile that they do. And then based on what those projectiles do, do something you want, whatever it is. So. Oh, okay. Yeah, when, you're, when you're talking about data, like two things that I usually like to add is uh, one is the sender because you'll you'll often have cases where the context of who fired the shot, whether or not it should hit or collide or whatever, is relevant. Almost um, always relevant. Mm -hmm. And then the other one is a very simple solution is to just have a tag array and a payload object, mm. and that way you can for your filtering and sorting, you can just have stuff like, say, you had a um, statistics or analytics, you could basically say fired 10,000 electric shots. And so you could basically just listen for each of the shots, check its type, aggregate your collection, and then fire events at the appropriate thing. And then things like a payload object can be really useful for, um, you know, any any per bullet generator. Like you might have something, a modifier on a weapon which says every sixth shot gets like 
plus five percent something or other and so you could basically pass a payload of modifiers to the bullet so on collision it checks for payload modifiers and applies them as it as it applies or whatever so yeah. they're, they're the ones i usually add yeah that makes sense um, we do have some. We have, do have the the shooter, the projectile, and the projectile knows who shot it. So you can get some of that. But I think having a, a very nice open object that can just hold any sort of arbitrary data that people want to pass into it makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. um, ultimately, ultimately, the the goal of this was to make it very flexible and customizable because you know, like I said, it, it's nice when an asset just does one thing and one thing really well, and you want that one thing. But it's also <laughs> nice when you can then take that asset. And do something else that maybe nobody else wants to do, but I want to do. And those integrations and other things will are are, are important to me too. So um, those lookins highly valuable. Yeah. That's that's for me was a good maker or breaker to integrate to my project. How easily can I hook into its behavior and mess around? And yours has all the events I would ever want. Yeah, that's by the way. If you're if you're gonna do a demo scene, I legitimately think a really good example um, is if you use the asset choreographer. It basically can add an event mm -hmm. track to a song. Um, you can just hook up your spawner, and you could literally have your bullets firing to the beat. And I think that would look really cool. And it's literally three lines of code because yeah. at the end of the day, it's just a fire event. Yeah. But I've noticed from my own projects that just adding that adds like a lot of extras, especially if you had things like on certain beats, it changes the bullet type. So now you've got like it switching and doing stuff like. You could do a lot with that. Yeah. There's um, I one thing at the GDC, and this happened at Unite as well at the party, which I barely got invited to. By the way, I wasn't going to the party. Then an hour and a half before, I got a secret hookup in, in invite, which was nice. But the party had um, Wyman. I don't know if you remember this when the DJ right before the DJ came out, they did this countdown on the big screen and to get everyone to look at. It. And then they had this whole demo by react reaction audio or something like that which was basically a sci-fi scene with a lot of stuff from the asset store oh that i couldn't see it oh, yeah, i could hear it. it and i could kind of see it but i was upstairs oh. and i'm short and there were way too many tall people in front of me uh. so i couldn't <laughs> see anything so i just gave up i was like oh the unity logo is up there oh cool and then i was like yeah it was a re it's react i think it's called reactional audio and it's basically a scene that's doing the same thing that choreographer does oh. with making the particles and the things and the camera shake all go with the beat of the music so it's oh, i missed that yeah, i didn't know it was going to be something cool i just thought it was a dj so i was like oh, i can't see what's going on it's kind I guess of they're going to play some music now and then I, that's when i went downstairs to the bowling alley Oh, I oh I didn't even see the bowling alley. Not like I like bowling, but I never. Oh no, there was a whole bottom floor with like two more bars and a bowling alley. Oh, I went to the top floor with one more bar and a photo booth. <laughs> oh yeah, you missed. Uh, it it was uh it was big. It was weird. You didn't go to the bowling bar, Andrew. Damn, you only went to the photo bar. Right? Yeah, it was there. It was, there, it was, it was four stories. Booth. Um, got to yeah. talk to lots of people. It was really cool. I did get to meet the uh, battle bit guys, by the way. Oh. This is a really cool thing you guys talking about not having super high fidelity and being really successful. They did exactly that with yeah. you know super blocky characters, just make a fun game. If it was really want, cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's the most important, important thing. The, the rest doesn't matter if it's fun. Yep. Yeah. Poor design trumps presentation every time. Oh, like, yeah. Pe yeah. People get very hung up on presentation. It's yeah, is it fun? To, yeah, well, the presentation is important for marketing. It's mm -hmm. important to capture your target audience who always sees that image or that style and thinks, ooh, is this a game I like? But then oftentimes, for me at least, I'll do that and then I'll be like, oh no, that game has nothing to do with the image I just saw. What the, what this is iOS stuff now. And then I get annoyed. But in the end, yeah, it's People judge the book by their cover, but beyond that, the fun is if you, if it's fun, it could be stick figures. Nobody cares if you're laughing and having a good time. There you go. Yep. One thing gets them in the door; the other actually keeps them in there, and that's yeah. how you get a real customer. Uh, on the on the graphics uh, part of it, it's something that I just find fascinating. Um, that game, um, the I'm forgetting the name of it now, but the the one where you're collecting objects, your um, the the work one. You know what I'm talking about? It's the multiplayer. That's a, that's a lot of them. It's it's a new the game the where you collect things and it's multiplayer. It's it's the horror yeah. house <laughs> stuff. You're, you're going you're going from planet to planet. And you're collecting stuff um, with your friends and your. Uh, there's like the tentacle monster boss guy who's like the the. Shopkeeper. Oh, lethal company, lethal company, lethal company. Thank you. Yeah. Um. There. So that's made in Unity. But the bit that fascinates me about that is obviously it looks low fidelity. Like it's got a low res filter effect on it. 
Um, but it's a horror game. And so horror games, what you, you do need in atmospheric environment stuff. And so it makes people laugh, but that's actually in HDRP because they wanted the volumetric fog. But to mm. keep the performance good, despite being HDRP, it's actually rendered at like 480 and then scales up the resolution. <laughs> so they're actually doing just like what we were saying before. They're actual, because they, the, the low the low res effect isn't an effect. It is literally rendered at low resolution and scaled up. But they're managing to leverage all of the actual like lighting effects and features that you would want from a high render pipeline. So just, mm -hmm. that was a, a cool thing to... And visually, it, it adds to the kind of blocky retro feel. It, all, it feels like you're looking through a grainy kind of bad film grain, and it adds to the atmosphere. It would be worse if it was clear. There you go. Oh. Keith, oh, yeah. Keith asked, by the way, Keith asked uh, ETA on this. I answered in the chat, but I think weeks is the right answer. Uh, I'm, this is basically why I'm focused on mostly. Um, but, we, you know, given that, Jason and Jason just threw some things I have to add now. Uh, um, I'm going to add those. And then and I do need to redo the object pooling. It's got object pooling built in. But right now, it's it's kind of tightly coupled. And I don't like that. So I need to extract that and make it not coupled at all. So you can just use any object pooler you want uh, or none um, or your own or, you know, and, and not have to worry about like you can just use mine by default, but you can choose to not use. Yeah, mine. people are probably just want to. Most are going to want to use yours. That, that's my yeah. guess, but yeah. somebody yeah. out there is going to be like, "But I already have an object pooling system." Or but projectiles like are like the first thing that you pull, so yeah. hopefully, it's, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. hopefully they they haven't picked one yet. Yeah. So um, I I did want to show the the eyeball real quick, yeah. Andrew. So you, you'd uh, you'd mentioned eyeballs, and that's one of your characters that I I pulled in here. That that pop up it's, menu this here. This is actually the first I character I pulled into my uh, Legend of the Stones recently as well. It was the fly. Oh yeah. It's just it's a great it's a great character for just throwing in because it does cool things and it looks cool and it moves pretty easily and it can also fly if you want it to fly. Here's my horrible orc. Yeah, I, I love that. The eyeball is cool. And then this is my favorite one. So this is the one I was trying to show earlier. You eat him. Unfortunately, um, the stun isn't working. So he, it still kicks me while it's inside me. But eventually oh. it gets spit back out. <laughs> and I switch over to Medusa and smack it. So adding in the passives now. So if you stare at Medusa for too long, you'll turn to stone. And oh, nice. they, they'll all get they'll all get a passive and an active. And uh, obviously I got to fix that and reparent it to the bone. But I've been having a lot of fun using your stuff, so I, I just want to say thanks for making the uh, making lots of awesome. cool stuff. It's, it's like nice, that. easy plug and play. I, I enjoy it. The eyeballs looking good. Yeah, you're you're like my D and D theme of stuff. The one thing I haven't figured out yet is uh, if you're a cube and you eat somebody and you change forms, I think I'm gonna have to make you spit them out because otherwise, oh, I died. Yeah, when you die, it, it bugs out. But when um. Yeah, if you if you run around and trans transform into an eyeball, it looks really weird when you've just got you know you're running around as an eyeball with somebody else stuck in the middle of you. So you don't have people stuck in your eyeballs, Jason. That's called seeing them. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Galileo VR asked how multiplayer friendly it is. It's a hundred percent multiplayer. That's just running in host mode. Um, it's built multiplayer first, so it runs dedicated server or hosted, and then uh, it, the plan for it is five players by default. But I'll probably just support two to eight. And then it's all single, single person per team. But there's no reason that wouldn't be adjustable too. I actually took um, the core work from the multiplayer mastery course and just started. I thought like, hey, what would it take to turn this into a MOBA? And it turned out it was about two days of effort. So got that switched over and then decided it was actually fun and I try to build it out as a game and see what happens. So. Awesome. Uh, I should have a playable game. demo for us next week so we can all Ooh. hop in and um, you can all fuck me up at the game that I made and show Hell me all the crashes yeah. and stuff. But nice. I want to have at least a four player, five player playable version next week where we can jump in with you know, eight, 18 classes. I just have to go add like another 15 passive abilities and the code for those. But it's actually really simple. Um, I, I want to do some videos on the process of that. When you've got a modular system for combat and abilities, um, it becomes really easy. In fact, I was going to add the shield ability that I mm -hmm. put in for the uh, rhinoceros guy. So the the rhinoceros beetle, which just looks like the the dude from um, what is that? Uh, Bugs Life, like the guy that they fly <laughs> around on. Oh and, yeah, 
that one. Yeah. So when I wanted to add him, uh, I wanted to give him a passive ability, and his was one of the first. I just decided to give him a shield. So it's like an armor that buffs up shield. And at first, for a few minutes, I put in a, a new variable for the shield amount. And then I started going through and hooking things up and adding code. Then I realized I don't actually need this variable because everything's so modular that I just add a buff that modifies a pool. And then that pool is a new shield pool. And the only change to my code was that when I do damage, I just see if I have a shield on there and then take stuff out of the shield pool. So ended up being about four lines of code change to add the whole thing. Uh, plus like another two lines for the UI because I wanted to add a slider that showed up there at the top um, over the shield. But uh, it made it a uh, really simple. Plus it all worked um, basically at runtime. So I go in and mm. add my pools and stuff, add the whole ability, hook it on, and it kind of works doing it without changing anything. It's all inscriptable objects. So I can do it while I'm playing and running, go in, modify, add abilities. And other than the UI, um, you know, refreshing my icon, everything works. Awesome. So, Making games that we'll be able to play together sounds pretty fun. Yeah, yeah, it should be fun. Um, oh, the other thing I didn't show you. Oh, I'll show you real quick. The last bit. See, I'm always looking for feedback and ideas. And if anybody here or in chat has some uh, some feedback or ideas, please let me know. But um, the other thing I've added in here. Let's see. It's randomized. Pick a couple. Yeah, you can you can be a tower right now or a chicken too. Hmm. Not, not not good options. But <laughs> But, uh, I want to be it, a chicken. That's my life's dream. Well, that, that is an option, but right now it's uh, rotated 90 degrees. Oh, and the towers are, are moving accidentally. Hmm. But yeah, see, here's a chicken. Um, but the thing I was going to show you is the spawners are the same way. So you pick your, your roles, the UI for it got broken, but you pick the ones that you want, and then it'll spawn them. And uh, when the AI is not broken, they'll run out and they're just the creeps that go out from the spawners and push. And then they use the abilities and the, the classes that you gave them. Apparently yeah. I, I broke it sometime last night, but yeah, that's uh, the state of things. So get ready to play next week and uh, kick my ass. I assume I'm putting on my beta tester gloves. Okay. We're ready. And if you got any ideas for abilities, um, I need active abilities and passive ones. I've got them for some of the guys, especially Andrew's ones. I've got a couple of them down. Um, but yeah, I'm looking for more. So <laughs> if you got cool, I've mostly just stolen League of Legends abilities. <laughs> That's my primary source of, uh, of inspiration is like, oh yeah, like like the caterpillar guy turns into a ramus ball, rolls around, and then does damage when he hits. You know, um, July cube was easy. That was an obvious one. He should eat you. Yeah. <laughs> I want you to add one sci-fi character that is just an alien with. Oh alien no, I'm adding at least six. I'm going to add in a oh, full okay, set good. of Proto Factor oh. ones. Oh, nice, yeah. nice, nice, nice. Yeah, nice. Proto Factor is after I get the abilities working for these 12, I've got six ears and six insects. I'm going to do six Proto Factor ones. I just want to make sure that uh, I don't want to get too many in there that don't work. So I want to get these mm -hmm. ones working and then I'm going to add those in next. Yeah, because I want it to be it, not not just RPG fantasy ish, but like, you know, Science wild fantasy. shit, like all over fantasy the place. Nice. You know, pop in some anime characters. You make whatever the hell you want. I don't care. <laughs> my my neuron was activated when you said anime. Uh, I've got recommendations if you ever need it. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was thinking more like kind of like a Kingdom Hearts style. Like mm -hmm. you're jumping in, you're switching between things and doing combos on stuff. So having oh, like a big variety of things and then just giving them some abilities that interact and have some synergy is where it'd be fun. And then the I think the most fun part will be figuring out the different combinations and trying those out. Because I want to go with like ten to fifteen minute matches. So they're pretty quick, and then you go back in and try out different combos, kind of like a team fight tactics, where like you're going like, hey, this mm -hmm. time I want to try snipers, this time I want to try tanks or bruisers or whatever the fuck it is for this uh this season, you know. And I feel like you do kind of the same thing, um, but with the MOBA. <laughs> like, yeah, it seems like a super fun sandbox, like mixing and mashing them and trying out yeah. weird combinations. It definitely seems like the the interesting vibe for it. For I want to know what. Yeah my chicken robot army what what is the build comp on that, that that's kind of what i was thinking yeah being able to, to mix and match and do exactly those like have fun and then i was going to make it variable for the host so the host can pick you know you can have one thing or five or six how, however many you know the maxes that works with the keyboard but make it so that you could have a variable number of them and 
do the same for the spawners and just kind of let let people kind of customize the the game and the match mode and figure out what's most fun instead of me guessing i i'm going with four because that's qwer mm. <laughs> that's the only reason it bounce around what you got and that's why when we get that play test we'll have even yeah. more ideas they'll be flowing yep uh, should be fun so yeah anybody interested make sure you come back next week and check and check it out. it out if you want to see the code and you're in the course um it'll be up on the resources page too you can go through and dig through that stuff and see if there's useful info there um anybody got anything else interesting this week before we wrap it up uh sure why not i finished up the project i've been doing for two months uh bloated beyond where it should have been but it was a fun <laughs> animation test I uh, mentioned before I was playing like Persona 3 Reloaded, decided to do a mod where I just swap out one character wholesale. And this was way harder than it than I initially expected. Because when you do that, you have to recreate every animation that character had in them in order to not softlock your turn-based game. Mm. So there's a, there's a link to the YouTube video just for a little debug footage. The mod is out now. So if you want to swap your boss character with... Uh, fellow vtuber mori calliope by all means it was fun to put together with what was available fun to collect the animations and figure that out and i learned so much about unreal's build system my lord so much and <sighs> plenty of helpful people in like the modding discord it was it was it was a journey nice well i i just put the link in there so everybody can go check it out um that's, that sounds cool i'm gonna i'm gonna watch it too it's like so yep. how, how difficult was it? Was it super high. painful? It was it was a high difficulty because I've not done uh, a mod like this before for this game. Since it was in Unreal, there was already a lot of like communal knowledge for how to do it. Mm-hmm. But I had to still wait for other modding tools, people better than I, to build them out to make certain processes easier and us being able to comb through certain components of the game to recreate them. For instance, hair physics was not something we could recreate, so I had to do all that by hand. And the hand animations were by far the hardest part because every animation had to be redone more or less from scratch and fit the original frame count that the previous animation worked in. So making it both work aesthetically and work under those limitations was a fun back and forth, but also a very hard one. Uh, and, and he, he made the mistake of asking me for feedback. So you know. oh, yeah, <laughs> that, that was another like three weeks minimum. <laughs> Oh, it looks like uh, one of our viewers in chat, Richard, uh, made a Toon Roman Republican Army and put oh. the code in there. So if you're watching live, you can probably grab that. And whoever gets it first, go check that out. I'm going to have to pull that one up. I have not it's, seen that. It's been in the oh, chat for 30 seconds. I'm sure it's been claimed already. But... Ooh, <laughs> speaking of stuff, there is a humble bundle for Cinti Assets, everyone's favorite low poly manufacturer. That's really, really good. It had a bunch of assets I myself didn't even own yet. The Cinti 2 number two remix. So definitely want to check that out if you want to grab some cool Cinti stuff. I, for one as well, love the fact that they give it from the Cinti website so you can import it to either like Unity or Unreal. Because I like throwing around assets in both. Uh, I like it when they're in the asset store. So that way I can just go to the asset store tab and uh, hit import. Too lazy to go other places. <laughs> Speaking of that, I, I saw the um, asset manager preview stuff and got to play with that a bit. It's actually pretty damn cool. Um, I'm looking forward to using that in the future. There's some really promising stuff there. I feel like it's going to be hopefully the the new way that I pull in assets into the project. You know, after it gets a couple more updates and stuff, which I, I think it'd be really nice because you just grab things in and you don't have to grab down. A whole pack you don't have to put it all in like uh what i used to do is like export things to an asset pack and with this thing basically upload all of my prefabs and assets separately and then just pull them down um so it, it's pretty interesting and way cooler than i expected like i said when i first heard about it i, I thought it was going to be kind of not very useful because i don't have a big team of artists and stuff that i'm working with but after looking at it and the workflow improvements actually drastically better because can do some things to really speed things up um and, and just make it easier for me to find stuff kind of kind of like i've been using that asset data or asset inventory too thing since uh we talked about it last week or the week before and it, it's pretty handy but it's definitely not um perfect because it's got to pull everything down and i just have too many things it still hasn't finished indexing <laughs> everything yeah 
I feel like if I had a small number of assets, it'd be fine, but yeah, it's kind of crazy. Um, there was something else I was going to mention from the chat, but I cannot remember what it was anymore. Um, I don't know. Something else exciting in there. Did, did I miss anything super exciting? No, but I, I did see asset manager at GDC and I agree. It looks very interesting and promising. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, with the asset new asset manager, I think you can sign up for the beta now. I, I don't know if it's um, public. I don't know how the acceptance is, but I know I, I think I signed up for it a while ago and got in. I, I went to go sign up for it again and realized I was actually already in it because I had signed up for the first time, but I, I just never got around to using it because I didn't think it was going to be cool. Yeah. But essentially, so for everybody who's wondering why I thought it was cool, what you can do is like take your art, your assets, you can take a prefab that you've got, like a character, right click, hit upload to asset manager, and then in all of your projects, you can just go grab that character and pull it down without having to go grab the asset pack or any of the other stuff. And then it's got filtering and searcher and searching and all, all that kind of stuff in there too. So it made it really easy to do that kind of stuff. It's got nice previews and you can customize the previews. I didn't need to though. I just wanted to see like, you know, I put in like, I think the eyeball and I started putting in a couple of your characters and a couple of my custom ones to try it out. And it, it's been working great. So yeah, big fan. Um, I, I really hope that long-term it will get to the point where I can see like all of my assets from the asset store, that would be perfect. Um, until then, though, it's still really, really handy. Uh, yeah. But if it got to that point, it'd be like, you know, I, I would use it as my default. I, I probably wouldn't even go to the asset store. Well, you know, except for to look at sales and you know, like do discovery stuff. But. Yeah. And I, I'm pretty sure most people don't enjoy importing through package manager your assets. <laughs> So, I, what I don't enjoy is importing a whole bunch of stuff to try to figure out like the one thing that I want. Cause most of the time I want one thing out of a pack, not mm -hmm. the entire pack, but it's two gigs. Or when, when gig. say, it's when it's you... not just the import, right? It's yeah. the import followed by, okay, you just imported a large pack. That's got 10,000 audio files. We're going to sit and generate a meta file for each and every one of these before you've even decided if you want to look at any of them. It's like, yeah. can I not just pick a few and look at them? No, we're no, going to sit and, and generate uh, twice as much content first. So, but yeah. by doing all that, too, these are cached on your system. You have to go find that folder to get removed that cache. Otherwise you're going to have that two gigs forever. Yeah. Oh, I delete that folder once a week. Yeah. Mm. Is that I constantly run out of space from that, that damn folder. <laughs> Yeah. yeah but yeah i don't know that's a cool one though so if you haven't checked out the beta i would go try that out and um screw around with it i i don't know the page let me see if i can find it real quick uh asset manager beta uh, that one's really cool um let's see. here it is using the unity asset manager where's the beta part it's here so um here, I'll put I'll put the main page there, and then to have the oh here it is. Learn more. How, how do you who has access? I have no idea where you get it. I'm sure you find it somewhere. Just yeah, <laughs> look on Google. You can sift through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've not found it yet, but it's. Uh, I'll put it in the description too if I find it soon. I, I know I have it because like I said, I went and signed up for it again. Visual crazy thing of awesome. Okay. We're signed up for the new. Okay, I started reading through the chat like a, like I don't know how to do anything on a podcast. Oh, yeah. anybody got anything else before we wrap up for the week? Uh, the asset manager things on your cloud dashboard. So whenever you want to try that out, I think you have to sign into your Unity Cloud stuff because that's why I'm seeing the little beta tab. Otherwise, <sighs> no. You might have to go sign up in that. You might have to click and and approve or something. But you might already mm -hmm. be in it too. Maybe it's open now. I'm not sure potentially but yeah great cool. great exchange like can't wait <laughs> for the future yeah next yeah. week we get to play a game together it's game day so stay tuned yes next next week's gonna be a fun one everybody can uh kick my ass if anybody's got ideas for abilities and stuff um drop them in the comments i think you know, I, I want to take as many as possible oh one last thing i remember mm -hmm. now the final thing that i needed to mention before we go uh, everybody here, if and in chat, did you play Command and Conquer Generals? Nope. Yes, no. no. I, Story. I don't know of this. Wasn't that the mobile um, game? No, you, you, we've already had this conversation. You've shown me what you're going to. No, show. yeah, no. 
It's uh, the the RTS from the 90s from uh, Westwood. Mm -hmm. It was like, I would say, the last really great RTS. Command and Conquer, Zero Hour, General Zero Hour. But I met a guy at GDC who was making a spiritual successor for it. And oh. it is really, really freaking cool. Um, let me pull up the page for it real quick. It's Also, uh, does it have the wonderful voice lines? The voice lines are so much... So many of the memes are from the amazing work of I need some shoes. Yeah, so um, it's going to have some of those. I don't know. Um, you'll you'll have to go check it out. I, I'm going to put the link in chat. Mm -hmm. I'm going to share it. Um, but when I saw this thing at GDC, I lit up and it was probably one of the most, if not the most exciting thing that I saw. I think it probably was the most exciting thing because it's something I've been wanting somebody to make forever. Um, and it looks great. So if you haven't checked it out, if you like RTSs, um, go check it out. They're based in Turkey and I guess they've been building it for just over a year. They've got a demo and it's multiplayer built in uh, Unity Dots. So it's built for super scale. From the little bit of demos that I've seen so far, it looks like it's you know, taking advantage of that stuff and doing some really cool stuff. So yeah, if you like Command and Conquer, um, like I did, mm -hmm. <laughs> or you want to see a, a dots game, I, I think it's it's worth checking out. Nice, hundred so, percent. I'm I'm, I'm very excited to play it. I actually, yeah, I, I want to play the demo very soon. I'm not going to talk more about it because I don't know what all I can say. But yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a uh, it's fun stuff. Anyway, that, that's all I've got for this week. Um, Story, you got any any final words for the week? No, no? my my final words will be uh, I don't know. Yeah, um, have a good weekend, I guess. I'm I'm gonna go and uh, listen to an audio book and chill. This is the start of my weekend too, so you know I'm gonna just <laughs> relax for right. the rest of the week. I am going to sit and code. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. <laughs> Pass pretty out. sure my my final words will be that's not a lion <laughs> <laughs> all right cool well yeah it was great seeing everybody again uh if you're here with us live make sure you hit the thumbs up button if you're watching later do the same and if you haven't already gone to jason stories kofi and discord page the link is in the description and it's gonna pop up as soon as i find it right there so you can go check it out lots of good interesting discussion you can just go lurk and watch um or join the conversations I, it's still lots of fun i still just sit back and lurk on your channel i'm afraid to get into a discussion because i know i'm gonna end up spending like <laughs> yesterday so we were in the um the multiplayer mastery course call yesterday and we're story was there and we were talking and i didn't realize we were there for like almost three hours just yeah. talking it was like my wife came and she's like how long is this call exactly I'm like oh i didn't even realize we're just hanging out it's been like three hours now and just just chatting and having interesting discussions so yeah, get some of that in stories discord go check that out um and of course uh if you haven't already subscribed to pow how do you how do you pronounce this corvallis <laughs> Corvius. it's it's like my normal name did it so for better seo and you know i think it's cute Corvallis. Power Corvius. Okay. Got it. I just wanted to make sure I said it right. I knew I was going to pronounce it wrong. Are you sure it's not like French, like Power Corvallis? Look, I, I had like <laughs> three years of French and I still can barely speak it. Maybe a little bit leaked in for the EU. Oh, that's good stuff. Corvallis. Yeah, so go, go sign up. So, did you rename the channel too to Power Corvius? Uh, yeah, the main titling, the at is still 2000, just because okay. I haven't bothered to do that. And yeah. that's a little bit more of a launch. But I am basically reformatting it. Want to do redo my thumbnails, want to get into making more content as well. The mod was the first step in one aspect. And yeah, hopefully a lot more stuff soon. Also going to be experimenting with another little project that should be soonish. We just say soonish trademark, so I can't be called out for having bad deadlines, okay? <laughs> nice. Cool. And then, Andrew, any uh, last things you got coming up? Nope. There's sales on the asset store right now. But aside from that, uh, all right. Just got, oh, I, I mean, I guess I've been streaming a lot with this projectile thing. So if you want to join my streams, come to the Discord. And I always at everybody when I do a stream. So yeah, get some uh, requests there if you got ideas, yeah. things that you want to see in that thing. Um, yes. And then go check out some of Andrew's characters. It's really cool. Hey, you, I, 
having a project where I can use your characters and actually having like a good use for them. That's not a demo. I've tried to pull them into MMOs and stuff, but it's like stuff I can't show. And it's really cool when I got characters of yours that I can pull in and, and show because they look really good. Like they, they look much better in game and I haven't even done any lighting or URP updates. It's just, uh, uh, they're, they're a lot of fun to work Excellent. with too. And the variation's cool. So I get to go in and, and play around and figure out what I wanted to look like. Yeah. Great. It's good to hear. Uh, yeah. Anyway, yeah, I just want to say that. Th- thanks. And those things are awesome. Anyway. Yeah. Thanks for joining us, everybody. If you got uh, questions, comments, leave them down below. And if not, just make sure you subscribe and we will see you again next week. See y'all soon.